Well, greetings, Imagination connoisseurs, and you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. Once again, it is I, your notoriously sanctimonious RMB, Robert Meyer Bernard, here for Rob Observations live chat number 184. By God, 184. Well, listen, you know, of course, Rob Observations is the show about something, and it's become something because of you, the great audience here at the Post Geek Singularity. You members of this, the Post Geek Singularity, you imagination connoisseurs, you make this show what it is. Now, before I get started, I would ask, I would ask a question. I, I, you know, I, would, I wanna make a request. So over the last couple of days, I talked about this before, I've had a lot of people talking to me, sending me letters about how they felt personally attacked, like in the live chats and by people when they're sharing their ideas. And I would say, as you all know, this is supposed to be a place where we can discuss people's ideas and not attack people personally. Now, I share lots of letters with people that I don't necessarily agree with, but I think they're good letters and I think that they're usually good conversation stars. And so does Gilbert here. Gilbert thinks that as well. So I would just, what, what? I would just want everybody to be mindful of, look, if I read a letter that you just totally vehemently disagree with, I would just ask that no, that I picked it to share. So I think the letter writer has an idea that's worth discussing. And and the whole point of all of this is to be, what, is, what do you want, Gilbert? He, I, do, do you want a cookie? Does, is that what you're doing now? Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys, you can come up and get a cookie if you want, but you got to shut up. When I'm doing my show. You want a cookie? Come here. Come here, Gilbert. Come around. Yeah, you come up and you come up top. You get up here. There you go. Good boy. Now, if that's what you want, if you want a cookie, that means you have to be quiet. Okay? And that means Tallulah gets a cookie too. And a second cookie because you got two. No, you don't get the bag. See, look at this. You don't get the bag. Okay, you get three. You get one more cookie, okay? That's all you get. One more cookie. I know you're well trained. One more cookie. Get down. Down, down. You gotta get down. You want a cookie? Get down. Come over here. Get down. Good boy. Now you get a cookie, and you get a cookie, and that's it. Now I can start the show. Sorry, I think they waited because they just wanted to be seen. Tallulah and Gilbert just wanted to be seen on the show. But anyway, anyway, what I was trying to say is that just be mindful of of the people and discuss or or debate the ideas that's what i hope for the show that's what i want for the show and look i know when i pick a a, a certain topic that might be divisive i know it's going to be divisive but what i'm hoping is that we can all discuss it and and discuss it and 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 have an interesting dialogue and not rip each other apart let's talk about the idea that's all i ask that's all i request and to that end because i didn't read any letters it's funny i didn't read any letters yesterday and everybody was like why did you only go on for an hour <laughs> which actually made me feel pretty good to be honest but this letter comes in from doug harris and i believe doug has written me this is his first letter and i really like this letter and i've been thinking about this letter since i read it and i thought it would be a great topic for discussion because it's something that i personally think about in my own life all the time and it hits close to home but it's also something that i've been contemplating for dare i say it many years uh hopefully i will contemplate this 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 issue in many years to come but as i said i'm an old man with one foot in my grave so you never know but anyway this one comes from doug harris right off the bat topic of this conversation hi rob been a fan since collider heroes as an almost 40-year-old lifelong geek, I don't find 18 and 20-year-olds talking geek, stu geek stuff that interesting because they don't have the perspective, I guess that is the right word, that you or John Schnepp, rest in peace, have. That brings me to the topic I wanted to bring up about toxic fandom. I want to try and explain, not justify, a segment of toxic fans. I'm going to paraphrase a fellow Jersey boy, Kevin Smith, on his Fat Man Beyond show about modern comics that I'm going to expand into TV and movies. Quote, whenever something gets made, I'm just, or whenever I get, I don't know what the quote is, but whenever I get disappointed about something, I guess this is what Kevin Smith said, whenever I get disappointed about something, I remind myself 
that the stuff being produced today isn't being made for me, but for the kids of today. What we are experiencing now is something truly unique in the history of pop culture. This is the first time that franchises grew and lasted with the first generation that enjoyed them. My parents are in their 80s. They grew up with The Shadow and The Phantom, Dick Tracy, to name a few. While they tried to bring them back in the 90s, they were all a no-go. Star Trek and Star Wars are 50 and 40 years plus old and are still franchises. The original fans are now in their 50s and 60s. They are the first generation that can complain about more than music. The things that they grew up loving are also things that their children and grandchildren love as well. For the young people out there who are too young to remember or weren't born yet, toxic fandom isn't new. Remember when Mr. Mom was cast as Batman or the guy who played Jar Jar Binks was almost driven to commit suicide? The only real difference between then and now is the largest bullhorn that has ever existed is now available to everyone in their pocket. The more I think about what Kevin Smith said, the more in awe I am of the post-geek singularity. All the best to everyone in the PGS. Well, I want to say, first of all, thank you, uh, Doug, for writing a thoughtful letter. And, uh, you know, I don't think we can be reminded of this enough. I was lucky, as as many people who are middle-aged with one foot in their grave as I am, uh, were lucky to grow up with these things for the first time. We were there when they were new. And I think, and I've said this before on the show, in the case of, say, Star Wars, for instance, the first 10 years of my life, I, I grew up, as I've said, an imagination connoisseur all my life. I was a kid watching... Sci-fi theater on Tuesday, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, noon on Sunday, Sundays at two in the afternoon. Channel Eleven had sci-fi theater, so I grew up watching movies like the George Powell films that I loved: Destination Moon, War of the Worlds, When Worlds Collide, Conquest of Space. You know, I got to see Godzilla movies and just all kinds of science fiction, fantasy, and horror films growing up. I was a fan of Star Trek. Channel Eleven ran it every night at six o'clock on weeknights, but they surprisingly did not run it on the weekends, which always annoyed me to no end. But anyway, that that's the way it was. I grew up with James Bond movies on the ABC Sunday Night Movie, and they were, they were large-scale events. But Star Wars didn't exist. And I was 10 years old, and I saw it. I talked about how it opened on May 25th, but I believe I actually saw it on Sunday, May 29th. That's when I saw it. Still, it was opening weekend, and it was a movie that I was heavily anticipating. I had started reading uh, the fourth grade when Star Wars came out. I was also, I first got into the sci-fi book club and started reading canonical, the canonical greats sci-fi novels, you know, starting with things like Dune and the Foundation Trilogy and those things, and moved from there. So I started reading classical sci-fi when I was 10, I was already just completely a huge Star Trek fan. I loved Space 1999. I enjoyed all the Irwin Allen movies or TV shows like Land of the Giants and Time Tunnel. And even, I, I actually, I never really liked Lost in Space, but Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, certainly. And I was a huge science fiction fan. And, and it was deeply ingrained in me by the time that Star Wars came out. But this cannot be stressed enough. <clears throat> Star Wars was like nothing anyone had ever seen before. The verisimilitude Star Wars had, everything about it, from the opening shot when the camera pans down. Please, Gilbert, I've already given you cookies. Do not try and bribe me again. I love this dog, but he's smarter than, he's smarter, he's too smart for his own good. But the, the, the important thing is that no one had seen Star Wars before. Nothing like it, nothing even remotely similar. Sure, we'd received big-budget sci-fi films before, obviously 2001, Planet of the Apes, Logan's Run came out the year before, even though it looks like it came out 30 years before. Rollerball came out in 1975. By the way, as an aside, as an aside, I don't even know if I showed this before, but this is the first time this ever happened. I'm going to show it again. 
because they are reshipping me another one. Uh, my rollerball, my arrow rollerball Blu-ray arrived like this. It arrived crushed. The disc is bent, but Amazon UK is sending me another one. But it was very, very upsetting. But anyway, so there, there had been big budget efforts, sci-fi efforts on the screen, but nothing like Star Wars. Star Wars was was not only was it a a transcendent film and an experience when you went to the movie theater because of the combination of the lived-in future and the fact that really Star Wars is about two workaday dudes, a farm boy and a truck driver, essentially, and then your old wizened war veteran, they all have to go off on a damn fool crusade. So even the fact that we're basically watching a bunch of blue-collar workaday guys, even Kenobi, go off and try and save a princess and get embroiled in an in a intergalactic war, a struggle, all of it. And the, the ship designs, the Millennium Falcon, the X-Wings, the TIE Fighters, the Death Star, all of these things that we now take for granted, when they were new, were mind-blowing. And, and they literally were something our collective imaginations had not ever had before. Star Trek, of course, as much as I loved it, it was a clean future. It was a different future. And basically, Star Trek was about elites, about the best of the best. And I think one of the qualities that Star Wars had that frequently gets missed or glossed over is the fact that your protagonists were just kind of everyday working dudes. I mean, Luke worked on his uncle's moisture farm. Han Solo was, I mean, they try and gussy it up by telling us he's a smuggler. Yeah, but really, he might have been, but he was basically running moonshine. You know, it's not like he was smuggling uh, at the James Bond level. <laughs> you know, Job the Hutt was never a Bond level villain in the Star Wars universe. So, one of the, I think, great appeals of Star Wars is that we, as audience members, women certainly could see themselves as the sassy Princess Leia, but dudes, if you were younger, you could imagine growing up and being Luke Skywalker, or you could identify as Han Solo. And everybody who watched that movie, I think collectively, boys, girls, men, women, fathers, mothers, grandparents, everyone found something to like in Star Wars. And it really... Uh, it was an imagination bomb that went off across all cultures, and it really became this sort of, certainly an American phenomenon, maybe a phenomenon in the Western world. Um, I guess it would be looked at differently in other parts of the world, but it was really, for those of the people who were watching it, it truly was something we'd never seen before. And it, it became so ingrained so very quickly in our culture. And you can see evidence of this. The great book that came out, The Art of Star Wars, the original Art of Star Wars, Art of Empire, and Art of Jedi. But The Art of Star Wars, I still have my first edition hardcover copy of that. But there was in that book, they've got political cartoons, and they show you um, pop culture indications of how deep Star Wars was penetrating the zeitgeist of the culture at the time. And of course, we were just a few years after we pulled out of Vietnam, and I think this escapist entertainment that really did have political undertones about, let's face it, a rebellion fighting against an evil empire. I mean, it was all there. I guess it wasn't so subtle at all, but but that's really what it was about. It was about freedom fighters, and I think a lot of people, especially American audiences, saw the characters in Star Wars as uniquely American, and the Nazi iconography was not lost on anyone. Stormtroopers, Imperial officers, Darth Vader clad in black. I mean, this these were not subtle things, but they were things that really went to the core of our imaginations. So it's very interesting to me that a product of the 70s, the time when I grew up, has now become something that we are in fandom. We're now 42 years on from Star Wars, and it's as vibrant as ever. Disney opened their $1 billion attraction, Galaxy's Edge. Um, we, we, we have a Rise of Skywalker, the ninth Skywalker saga film coming out from Disney, which they just expect to gross a billion dollars. We still have toys being made. We still have all kinds of products being made. I think Star Wars is as much a part of our culture as it's ever been. Now it's sort of ubiquitous. It's everywhere. But as Doug brought up, 
if you're somebody who grew up like myself, who was a first generation ground zero Star Wars fan, I the the idea that new Star Wars movies are are not being made for me is kind of like, well, how can that be? I always thought that Star Wars was sort of made. It wasn't made for just for kids, but it was made for the kid kids and all of us. And the thing about Star Wars is it had obviously universal appeal. As a kid, it became hugely important to me, the same way that Star Trek did. And that the fact the fact that both of these franchises are still vibrant. Um, Sean and Julie Benson, friends of mine, they were just announced as being on the writing staff of the new Nickelodeon animated Star Trek series. I never would have thought there would ever be an animated Nickelodeon Star Trek series because the last time we got an animated Star Trek series, it was in the mid-70s. So all of these things are very interesting to me to watch these franchises sort of live, breathe, evolve, and grow as I have lived, breathed, evolved, and grew through my own life. And while I still love them, I still love Star Wars, and I certainly still love Star Trek. Uh, you might... When I say this, you might laugh. I don't obsess about them the way that I used to. Like, I literally, when it came to Star Trek, I had blueprints and books, and I would literally spread them out around me, and I was buying non-licensed merchandise, and it was crazy. And and now, what's interesting is multi-generations of fans have, have grown up around all of this stuff, and it's it's pretty great. We've got Star Trek LV, Star Trek Las Vegas happening this weekend. I will not be there, but the big yearly, the biggest yearly creation Star Trek convention. And the thing is, I wonder if you grew up, if you are 20, you know, or 15. Now, you might love Star Wars, but there is in no way can I stress enough that you could never have had Star Wars would never have had the impact on you that it had on audiences that had never seen anything like it before. You who are younger were born into a world where Star Wars already existed. And I think one of the interesting things about fandom, as Doug pointed out, is the perspective that we all have. I mean, that's why when I, when I was younger, there were certainly people who argued over franchises. When Michael Keaton was cast as Batman back in, what, 80, 87, 88, when it was first dropped that Mr. Mom or Billy Blazjowski, depending on what you knew Michael Keaton from, that he was going to play Batman, I was going to the comic book store every week, even back then, and that was not a popular decision at all, because Bruce Wayne, we always saw him as a big guy, and, and Tim Burton took a different approach, and I think it worked. Now, there's a lot of people that grew up with the Tim Burton Batman already in existence. But what's interesting to me is do these franchises, like, do I have the right, like Kevin Smith said, not the right, but are really these franchises being made for not me anymore? Because I'm an old school fan and the way Star Trek is being made now and what it's after now is different than what it was after during its original inception. Well, that's an interesting thing to say or, or, or contemplate or, or, I guess, wonder about, which I do. And I, I find it interesting because most of the people that are working on these franchises now were not necessarily even born when the franchises were new. And so they didn't live through that. So the franchises, again, are, 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 are different for them than, say, they are for me. And and one of the thing that one of the things I think that's happened is because these franchises have become such a part of our pop culture, the take on what they are actually all about and what they all mean is um, sort of different now than when it was back in the day. Like now, it's very difficult for people to consider the original series, the Star Trek, the original series without looking at it through a lens of kitsch. We've seen Simpson parodies. We've seen the William Shatner Get a Life sketch on Saturday Night Live that's 33 years old this year. We've looked at all of these things, and our franchises are no longer... To me, both Star Wars and Star Trek growing up were holy. They were holy things. And if you were going to 
contemplate them, you had to do it very seriously. When I was younger, these were very serious things. Now, what's really interesting is, is, is now they've just become corporate product. We're now watching the exploitation of these franchises simply as money-making exercises. If you're lucky, we'll get people like who are working on The Mandalorian and having not seen it, I'm hoping for peak Star Wars. I'm hoping for everybody that that is making The Mandalorian really understands and they've sort of allowed it to be its own thing. It's had a little bit more breathing room. The pressure on Disney was off because they've already delivered. They've basically made back the money that they spent on the Star Wars franchise. So now it's time to play around with it a little more because they have a little bit uh, more leeway especially with their shareholders. But at the end of the day, why is it, why should I still be obsessing over Star Wars as a middle-aged man? And is it is it for me? And it's interesting because the vitriol that was directed at The Last Jedi, I've often wondered, I'm like, I didn't feel that vitriol. I was just happy to see another Star Wars movie. And I still look at The Last Jedi and I'm like, that's that's interesting. Because while I, I can admit that perhaps the writing is not as good as I might have wanted it to be, or the plotting might not have been as tight, I am used to in my life uh, having a, a relationship with my franchises that ebb and flow. Certainly the Star Trek franchise, beginning with Star Trek The Motion Picture, to my mind, took Star Trek to its, its greatest heights because it was a continuation of the TV show. And then with Star Trek... Two and onward, the Star Trek movie series was it was made as by the television division, and they treated it like television. It was made with television budgets, basically. Sure, sure, they got higher. It wasn't until J.J. Abrams' Star Trek 09 that it it had a real movie budget again. I mean, a real sci-fi movie budget. But unfortunately, it was directed. It was presided over by a man who, as I've said before, in every interview, he would go out of his way to say, oh, "I was never a Star Trek fan." So what's happened with our beloved franchises is now there's lots of people that are working on them and it's just a job to them. You know, the Michelle Paradise, I'm sure was, I've never heard her say she was a great big Star Trek fan yet. She takes over as the, uh, one of the showrunners of Star Trek discovery, you know, and of course everybody says, Oh, of course I'm a Star Trek fan. I always grew up being a Star Trek fan. Really though? Like really did you? So now, as an old school fan, I have to endure my franchises, which are now basically money-making exercises that are not made for me, like Kevin Smith said, but they're not made for kids either. They're basically made for the, the public at large. These are now things, because we live in the post-geek singularity, everyone's a geek. Everyone's a part of this. Everyone loves this stuff. So our franchises are different than they used to be. And you know, I wonder, what does that mean? Where does that leave us? Um, I, I don't know. I know that my franchises don't mean nearly as much to me as they used to. And I don't think they could because I am old and I don't have the promise that exists in youth that's going to take me through the rest of my life. I mean, I've lived a lot of my life. I hope I have a lot more life to live. But uh, I just, I don't puzzle over these franchises. I certainly don't have the time to do so that I used to. So they mean different things than they did in the past, to me at least. And yet, as we get older, we still bitch and moan and complain about them on the internet because we have the internet now. And I just wonder, what does it all mean? How do we recontextualize these things? And what happens when a franchise is 42 years old? When now you have multi-generations of people expecting different things from it. And uh, this is this is the question that I'm I'm constantly puzzling over. I mean, I still like to collect Star Wars toys. I like hot toys, you know, Darth Maul on a Sith speeder, or I still like collecting diecast Eagle transporters from Space 1999. But I wonder why. Do I need them anymore? I can't take them with me when I leave this mortal coil, and yet they still delight me to no end. So what what does my where do I contextualize my fandom? What does it all mean? I, I, I don't know what it all means, um, but I wonder, and I, I, I thought it was worth contemplating that question. 
and and how do we how do you guys feel like what do you think about our franchises that we love look i've been reading the justice league of america since i was five now does the justice league of america should it mean the same thing that it meant to me when i was five years old i don't think so uh i, I think what's interesting is that all the toys all the things i dreamt about when i was a kid have now come to pass and so i still love these things they haven't gone away there's been enough that has gone on that's made me feel connected i'm still connected to star wars but i think what's really interesting is that the reasons these franchises are being made and the people that are making them because they didn't create them they didn't originate them the desire for any creative person is to make something your own and what's happening is i think the franchises are not necessarily being as well served as they could be uh i certainly know that the, the people that are making Star Trek Discovery, for instance, some, I guess, are big, really into it. But there, I don't see when I can watch other shows like The Expanse and feel I have a more satisfying space opera experience with a new show as opposed to a show that has been around for so long. I mean, look at how everybody bitches about all these old franchises. You've got the fan base, especially older fans, bitching and complaining more, whether it's Doctor Who whether it's James Bond, whether it's Star Trek, whether it's Star Wars, the older fans uh, who have this deep, deep, deep connection to the way it made them feel and the way they they connected with this material as it's changing and basically becoming, uh, it, it's what it's all corporate product now. And now I'm under no illusions that it wasn't always product, but it wasn't as much of a product because now there's an expectation with all this stuff that it's successful. There's an expectation Star Wars is a money-making franchise, and it is. There's an expectation that Star Trek should be just like Star Wars and be as money-making as Star Wars is. So the reason these franchises even exist is because they're owned by corporations that want to exploit them to make more money. They're just product. And before, George Lucas was making the, the Star Wars prequels, but he owned them. You know, they were his. No one could tell him what to do. And so, yeah, he wanted to make these movies. He knew they were going to make money. He wanted to keep his business going. I'm under no illusions about that. But it was basically his. So you were still getting, even with the prequels, you were still getting the vision of one man. And he was pursuing his art the way he wanted to pursue it. And so we were getting something unique. Even with the dawn of the new Star Trek franchises, the Berman era, it was Gene Roddenberry coming back to the fold. And then it was Berman through 25 seasons of Star Trek, keeping what he believed Gene Roddenberry wanted. Now, the studio was like, oh, you guys are doing a good job. Good for you. So they didn't really have to deal with a studio telling them what to do because what they were doing was working. Now it's the other way around. Now it's the studio is picking people to do these things and hoping they'll work. So it's it's all very, very different. And, and yet we're still bitching and moaning and complaining about it because we have the internet, which is fantastic that we can have these conversations now. But I just thought it was interesting to consider. I consider it all the time. But I wanted to thank Doug for writing in and bringing up this, this idea that I, I, I've been thinking about. So I want to thank him for sending in that letter. I thought it was a great topic to start the conversation off. So here we are. Uh, Anthony DeRisso sent in a super chat. Thank you. That was a very generous super chat, sir. Hey, Mr. B, I'm very interested in the Picard series, but I've never seen an episode of The Next Generation. Do you think that'll make a difference in my enjoyment and understanding of the show? Well, Anthony, 100% yes. I can honestly say it absolutely. You, you know, you really have to know. Uh, although, to be honest, I'll bet watching... Uh, if I told you to watch 20 various episodes of Next Generation, that's probably more episodes than most of the writing staff <laughs> will have experienced. Oh, I kid. I kid, don't I? But yeah, I think it's really important to know um, a lot about Picard because I, I'd be curious, why are you interested in the Picard series if you don't know Next Gen? It'd be very rewarding. Here, I'll give you, you know, I wasn't thinking about doing this, but I'm just, just going to do this right now. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a few episodes to watch of Star Trek The Next Generation. And I'll just, I'll give you like a few episodes per season. Um, so off the top of my head, season one, 
got to watch the pilot. You have to watch Encounter at Farpoint. Uh, then you have to watch uh, The Big Goodbye, uh, an episode called The Big Goodbye. Watch that. And uh, let's see, I'm just going to, I'm going to pull these up and just read down. I'll give them to you quick. I'll give them to you quick. Uh, Encounter at Farpoint, you need to watch that. Um, let's see. No, don't. You have to watch The Battle. You got to watch The Battle. I forgot about that. Big goodbye. I already said that. I would watch an episode called 11001001 because I really love that. Watch Heart of Glory. And watch... Uh, that's it. That's uh, of season one. That's, that's all you need to watch if you're just going Picard. Uh, let's see. I'll give you season two quickly. Um, why not? I'm just, you know what? Since I'm, uh, since I'm locked in, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to do it. Season, season two, I'll give you a few because you only need a few. There's not that many in season two you need to watch. Uh, I would watch Elementary Dear Data. Mm, you have to watch The Measure of a Man. Have to, and if you can, watch the Blu ray version because it's extended. Watch The Measure of a Man. Watch Q Who. You have to watch Q Who. It's important. Watch The Emissary. That's season two. Uh, let's see. Season three. As I go through this very quickly. Uh, Next Generation season three. Let's see. And again, I'm just going through these things quickly. Uh, the Survivors is a great episode of season three. I love that a lot. Who Watches the Watchers? Uh, the Enemy. No, no, don't watch the Enemy. The Defector. The Defector. Yesterday's Enterprise, Sins of the Father, Captain's Holiday, just because it's fun, Sarek, and The Best of Both Worlds, Part One. That's what I would say. These are just for Picard. This is not the best episodes of the whole show. These are just Picard episodes uh, that you should watch. And I think you're, there's 178 episodes in Next Generation. So if you if you go through these, you, you should be... Uh, um, up to speed but now season four probably has the most important episode to watch you have to watch best of both worlds part two but then you have to watch family the episode family uh you have to watch final mission final mission is important uh the wounded is important uh, i would watch their first first contact which is great you have to watch the drumhead which is awesome, and then Redemption. That's season four. Um, let's see. We go to season five. And, you know, I can, I can be rattling this off the top of my head, but it's easier just to look at. Uh, you have to watch Redemption Part 2. Darmok, very important. Ensign Row is a good episode. Disaster is a fun episode. Unifications Part 1 and 2, when Leonard Nimoy comes back. Um... Let's see. Uh, the Outcast, another great episode. The First Duty, very important episode for Picard. I Borg, extremely important because that plays into the new show. And one of the greatest Picard episodes ever, The Inner Light. That's season five. And let's see. Season six. First of all, you have to watch Chain of Command Part 1 and especially Part 2. That's on Season 6. Uh, Man of the People, which I really like. It's 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 not an episode people cite, cite very much, but I really like it. Relics is a great episode. Uh, Rascals, only because Picard gets turned into a kid because it's funny. I enjoy it. Chain of Command Part 1 and 2. Ship in a Bottle, which you should write, watch. Uh, and then finally... Um, I think that, oh, no, that's it. As far as Picard's going, I'm trying to, you know, give you a truncated version of, of the series. And finally, season seven, the last episode of Next Generation. Uh, let's see. Let's let's see what we can watch here. Oh, why am I looking at this? I, I'm on. Why, why am I looking at Game of Thrones? Uh, so that's not what I wanted to see. So let me give you season seven. Finally, let's see. There's not very many great episodes. You, know, you got to watch Gambit part one and part two. Um, the Pegasus. I would watch the Pegasus. Lower Decks. Journey's End. 
preemptive strike, and finally the season, the series finale, all good things. So watch those episodes. That's really important. And if you watch them, you don't have to watch all of them, but those are your Picard episodes off the top of my head that you should watch. JB Bonifacio says, oh, we've done the impossible and that makes us mighty. Brown coat for life. By the way, powers of X1 dropped today. The scope of it is quite a flex by Hickman. You know, I really can't wait to read Hickman's new X-Men books. I've read a little bit about what they are about, and they seem pretty interesting to me. Uh, I definitely want to catch up with them. I haven't really been interested in X-Men for a long time. Uh, Dan V900 says, uh, have you seen Prospect? You asked me this yesterday, dude. Uh, we talked about that yesterday. Have you seen Prospect? It's a great sci-fi movie starring Pedro Pascal with fantastic cinematography. Sophie Thatcher's the lead is great. Well, I want to thank you once again for your super chat, but I did talk about Prospect yesterday. Uh, I like Prospect a lot. It came from Dust, the YouTube channel Dust, that has a lot of sci-fi shorts on it. So yes, I highly recommend watching uh, Prospect. It's a great science fiction film. I thought it was good. Uh, now here comes another letter from Mike Wright. Happy day to you, Sanctimonious r &B. Once again, I'm bothering you with a letter. I still can't believe you got to do your film with the great Shat. I am loving your thoughts on Star Trek and Star Wars, especially when you explain how it should still have something for kids to enjoy. I totally agree with you. We all became fans as kids watching both Trek and Star Wars. I still remember, believe it or not, going very young with my mom to see The Empire Strikes Back on its first run. The only memory I have of that night was a beaten up Luke hanging upside down on those weather antennas. Why I don't remember the lightsaber fight, I don't know. The other early film memory I have around that same time is Superman 2. And it was at the end when Reeves does that reassuring smile you see as he flies past, giving you the feeling everything has been put right with the world. Man, I miss that sequence. It's funny what bits your memory holds up, holds on to. Here's a question for you. If you could be a daily visitor on one of your favorite movie sets any decade to watch behind the scenes magic, what film would it be? By the way, I'm hoping for somebody brave enough to do a long lost sequel to The Last Starfighter. Thanks, Rob. Mike Wright. Well, people have asked me that question before because when I was a DVD documentarian, I spent many, many long days on movie sets. If I could go back in time, there's a couple of movie sets I'd want to be on. My beloved Apocalypse Now, which the IMAX trailer just dropped Apocalypse Now Final Cut is coming out next month. I can't wait. Oh my God, it's amazing. I would love to have been on that set. I would love to have been on the set for All About Eve. Joseph Makowitz's Best Picture winner in 1950. I probably wanted to have been on the set of Vertigo just to watch Hitchcock direct. Maybe actually Rear Window because I would have wanted to meet Grace Kelly. Um, West Side Story, the original. I would love to have been on the set of West Side Story just to see that movie get made. Joan Robbins and, and Robert Wise working together. Of course, I would have wanted to have been on the set of Star Trek The Motion Picture just to talk to all my idols. And I'm sure it would have been stressful, but I would have loved to have been there. And uh, maybe Lawrence of Arabia just to watch how a movie like that is made. And uh, I don't know. I think that's pretty pretty much it. Things that come to the top of my head right now. Uh, but that's a great letter. It's a great question. Thank you for that. This next letter comes from Awesome Cat. Dear Mr. Burnett, I have not forgotten that I do owe you an email about a bunch of things, including why I think you're wrong about bad science fiction and would even argue fanfic is worse than bad science fiction. But that is for another day. I am sorry, but what is killing me to know is if my theory about Star Trek 3 is correct or not. That, in fact, it has nothing to do with saving Spock. But I do not know any Star Trek fans who know enough. Please punch holes in my theory. So many people, including the characters themselves, state that Kirk was willing to give up his career to save Spock. Even Spock points out the huge cost to Kirk, including the loss of his ship. However... And please correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, that's Sarek who points that out. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not think that's true. One thing everyone forgets when watching the movie is we, the audience, knows that Spock will be saved. I guess so, but you got to suspend your disbelief. We have an omniscient view. From the beginning, we know Spock is alive. And in fact, if we did not know Spock was alive, the movie really wouldn't make much sense. But if we step back and look at what's happening from the point of view of James T. Kirk, 
He doesn't know Spock is alive. Sarek doesn't know Spock is alive. James Kirk doesn't find out Spock's body is alive until he's already at the Genesis planet. When he asks Savik about the Vulcan boy. Up until that point, he's going to retrieve Spock's corpse for some odd reason. Save McCoy from a Vulcan mind meld. Now, why Sarek would insist they need Spock's body is beyond me. Which is why our knowing Spock is alive allows this story to make some sense. Kirk should have turned to Sarek and asked why he needs Spock's body. For all they know, Spock's body is disintegrated in the Genesis planet's atmosphere. There is no body to retrieve. But Sarek is surprised to see Spock's body is alive at the end of the movie. Kirk is surprised when Savik tells him the Vulcan is alive. The entire plot of Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, is we are going to retrieve the corpse of Spock to save McCoy from the effects of a Vulcan mind meld. Kirk is trying to save McCoy and not Spock. Kirk gave up nothing for Spock. Even destroying the ship was to save themselves. They didn't have a chance against the Klingons, and people keep using this movie as proof of how strong the friendship was between Kirk and Spock, but it really wasn't. Or am I wrong? Honestly, when you realize Kirk didn't know Spock was alive until the end, it breaks the movie. It feels like they started the script with the ending already in mind. Why would they need Spock's corpse to help McCoy? He is suffering from a Vulcan mind meld. They aren't putting Spock's Katra back into his dead body. It only makes sense if they knew Spock was alive, and before anyone tells me Kirk sensed it or whatever, of course he could have sensed Spock. McCoy was carrying his Katra. It meant nothing about the state of his body. They could have come up with ways to make Kirk knew Spock was alive. For example, the Reliant managed to get a message out before they were destroyed by the Klingons. Uh, you mean the Grissom. But then Kirk wouldn't have to disobey orders which is why I feel they wrote the script with the ending already in mind. They wanted Kirk to disobey orders, and they wanted him to end up exiled on Vulcan. Anyway, like I said, I'm really curious to know what you think. Am I wrong? Did I miss something? Thank you very much. The awesome Cat Gamer, a.k.a. the Muslim Gamer Girl. Well, Cat, thank you, awesome Cat, for writing me in, writing into me. I have to say, you are not wrong. Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock is a pile of gobbledygook. Yes, it is, people. And for every reason that Awesome Cat said, none of the movie makes any sense at all, however you go with it. Um, again, there was always in the original series, even in Spock's brain, some semblance of pseudoscience that you could actually believe in. Star Trek III blew that hole open and completely turned Vulcan mysticism into, uh, there's all kinds of craziness. The whole idea of a Katra, a living spirit, the idea of fall torpan, the refusion that you could actually take someone's Katra and put it back into their body. Why would you need that in the first place? <laughs> I mean, none of it made any sense. They needed a way to bring Spock back from the dead. And so they created all of this nonsense. But here's the thing. I do think that the movie does do a good job, a fine job of dealing with themes of mor mortality and the fact that you have a friendship. Look, it's both Spock and McCoy's pain, Spock's death and McCoy's pain that are driving Kirk. There's no denying that the movie really is about sacrifice and family. I mean, basically you have Scott's, Spock's father telling Kirk, you screwed up, dude. <laughs> like when Spock tells you you screwed up, it's bad. But when Spock's father tells you you screwed up, it's even worse. So there's a lot, I think, to love about Star Trek III. And fortunately, uh, it really shows that you have a first-time director making the movie, a, a first-time television guy making this movie. It's aside from ILM's effects, which are beautiful. They still had the A-Team back then. They were really doing a fine job. Uh, the rest of the movie, I'm sorry, it, it fails. As I've talked about on the show before, Harv Bennett's original storyline was far more interesting, with Vulcan wanting to secede from the Federation because of the horror of the Genesis device. Uh, they can't believe it exists, so they're angry. And it was just much more adult, the fact that there were no Klingons in the movie. It was all about the Romulans. That's why there's a bird of prey. All of that was from the original conception, the original storyline that I think was really dumbed down. But all of the gobbledygook about Vulcan mysticism, I hated all of it. And it, it, it infected Star Trek Discovery. And was it canonical? I suppose it, it had to be canonical. But then Discovery took all that and ran. And it, it's just... Uh, it, Star Trek Three to me, uh, you could make an argument. I could get into it more, but ruined the Star Trek film franchise. In a, in a way, it kind of ruined Star Trek. 
because there was a semblance of reality and and this the the Star Trek science felt real until we got to the idea of Vulcan mysticism, which uh, really I think was was really detrimental to Star Trek as a franchise. But I really want to thank you for writing in, Gamer Girl, um, uh, because I, awesome cat, because I don't have enough female audience members writing into me, and uh, it was great to hear from you. So thank you for your, your thoughtful letter. And I don't disagree. Uh, this letter, this next letter comes from Matthew DeFritis. Hey, Rob, first time writer, six month ish viewer. I have a hypothesis regarding Star Trek Picard. You do not have to share this with the post geek singularity, but if you are compelled to do so, I am. <laughs> I look forward, 10 forward, to watching your video. As said multiple times by Alex Kurtzman, Star Trek has always mirrored the times we live in. If we really look into this and the new trailer, I predict that the Romulans running the Borg Cube as a prison are actually running not necessarily a prison, but one of the camps similar to today's camps at or around the U.S. border. In this case, the Borg, following the destruction of the Borg Hive via Catherine Janeway, are trying to find refuge and now are being kept in said camps and returned to human or their native form. The primary lady, Dodge, I believe her character name is, most likely breaks free of this camp, finds Picard, and is then sent on a mission to liberate the Borg from these camps. Patrick Stewart in the past has stated how he was becoming a citizen of the U.S. to help put a stop to what is going on currently in the U.S. as far as the treatment of people and current political agendas. To me, it would make sense that this interest also spurns the topic for the show, as many are already outraged by the situation that we're currently in. I would like to state that I'm not trying to add politics or take a political side to your show or on into your show, but I'm making an observation of the times we live in. Would love to hear your thoughts. Sincerely, Matthew DeFritis. Well, Matthew, first of all, bang on, sir. And and I think Star Trek has always been an allegory. The best Star Trek has always been uh, an allegory for something that's going on during right now, during uh, during our uh, Star Trek always reflected the current time we live in, filtered through the prism of a science fiction action adventure show. And Star Trek was never covert about this either. Episodes like we've talked about, a private little war which is a very thinly veiled Vietnam allegory. Bread and Circuses, which is one of the better episodes of the original show that no one ever talks about, but Bread and Circuses commented on the media and our bloodlust, and it, it was very, very interesting. And I think that you're absolutely right. I think that what's going on with, of course, we know from the Countdown comic book that Alex Kurtzman was one of the architects of that was considered canonical, and it explained the setup to Star Trek 09. We know that the Narada, the ship, Nero's ship in Star Trek 09, was a ship with retrofitted Borg technology. And that's what they were using. So the Romulans, according to Kurtzman and Orsi, all the way back to 2009, the Romulans were using Borg technology. And why wouldn't they? Um, the Romulans were attacked by the Borg before even we were. So their relationship before the Federation was. So their relationship with the Borg goes back even longer than the Federation. So it would make sense that if the Borg collective was destroyed or discombobulated somehow, that the Romulans are taking advantage of this. And I think you're absolutely right. A lot of people talked about how she might be Lal, Data's daughter, which I don't think is true. I think she's a new character. I don't think she's the new Borg queen, or maybe she was being groomed to be the new Borg queen, and she does escape. I think you're exactly right. I think the idea of a whole population of people that are imprisoned, it might not be a direct allegory to what's going on on our southern border now, but it definitely is allegorical in nature in some way, shape, or form that people are being experimented upon, that Borg technology is being used. And why not? I mean, we're, we're not very far away from being Borgs ourselves. Once we get designer technology that we can extend our lifespans, or we just found out this week, as a matter of fact, that they've come out with contact lenses that by blinking, you can zoom in. And if you've watched years and years, you know that there's a minor subplot where a friend of one of the characters, well, I won't even tell you, but it's pretty horrifying. It's very Borg-like what happens. We're not very far away from all this. And as I've always wanted to, to, to the way I always thought about it was that the Borg technology began as a civilization that was combining their biological essence with their technological advancements, hoping to better their lives, and something went horribly awry. 
Um, and as I think I said once before, it was like the the anti cancer virus that Emma Thompson created in the remake or the latest version of I Am Legend that starred Will Smith. And of course, that turned into this horrible virus that turned the world into vampires. So I love that idea. I love that collectively as a society, we've given ourselves over to this new technology, which we have with our cell phones and all of that. And then it becomes so ubiquitous, we don't even think about it. And then one day, I mean, we get taken over and it becomes horrifying. We become basically zombified by our own technology. We have our humanity stripped away from us. Um, so I, I, Star Trek is a political show. It's always been a political show. And if you don't think it is, you're not paying attention. And I understand there's lots of people that just want to have escapist entertainment. One of the one of the things I love about the expanse is all of the politics in it. You've got these three societies. You've got Earth, Mars, and the belt. And everybody's got what various needs and wants and desires, and they're all at odds until later on, of course. But I love the political nature of, of science fiction. What is Star Wars about? It's about a rebellion against a, an empire. You have to know what an empire is. You have to know what a, a rebellion is. And I think it's, it's we now fear the problem. And the reason I wanted to make the statement up front about people that, that there's a couple of, I've got another uh, letter I'm going to read shortly uh, of people, you know, here's a place to discuss ideas. And if we're going to discuss things like toxic fandom, I'll, we need to be able to discuss politics without starting to name call one another. The ideas behind these things are what we should be discussing. And if somebody feels a certain way, especially when people come here, one thing's about the post-geek singularity, one of the things I've loved about it is I've received letters from people on both sides of the aisle and they feel that it's they can send them to me. And there's no bigger compliment than that. And one of the things I've liked about the post-geek singularity community up until fairly recently is that everybody can have a say and we can discuss it. And, and in the chat rooms and people have been fairly open to discussing these things, even if you disagree. Now, I try and read letters and I said I don't disagree with all of, I mean, I don't agree with all of them, but I, I, I do appreciate it when people can state their opinions in, in such a way as to at least make them palatable where, where the issues and the ideas themselves can be looked at and, and looked over. And I think, you know, one of the great things about speculative fiction, if you look at the Twilight Zone, classic, twi classic Twilight Zone and, and Star Trek, obviously, are probably two of my favorite shows of all time in terms of their meaning, but certainly classic Twilight Zone. And the whole point about classic Twilight Zone is it's enormously political. Many of those many of those episodes are enormously political, but they got away with it on TV because they couched it within the context of science fiction fantasy and in some cases horror. So it became palatable to an audience that didn't feel like here's here's a didactic discussion about Democrats and Republicans and blah blah blah. I love when politics is dealt with in the context of science fiction fantasy and horror. I love it. It makes it more palatable. You can discuss it with people. You know, Handmaid's Tale is a is a cautionary tale about Gilead, this strange, weird Christian society that somehow grew out of America. Well, I'm watching it played out in real life uh, on TV, and in, 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 in so I can watch the Handmaid's Tale and then watch the television for real and see certain things happening in 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 real life. And I think that I'll, I'll give you an example: reproductive rights. I am a, a, an adoptee. I, I, my mother had both me and a second child. I have a 100% biological sister and made the choice to give us up for adoption. She also had the choice to have us aborted, and I came this close to never existing. Now, I am pro-choice, 100% pro-choice. I'm 100% pro-choice. I believe in a woman's right to uh, control her body full stop. However... Do I think that there should be third trimester abortions? No, I don't. Unless there is going to be grievous harm done to a woman, I think third trimester abortions are monstrous. I think the decision should be made if, if you if you if we want to continue to have abortion, we have to make sure that our society doesn't take such a situation for granted. 
because ultimately it can result in a human life, such as myself, for instance. However, I do think that it's it becomes such a divisive issue. And, and when you have men making these decisions, when they don't ever have to deal with the consequences or ramifications, and when we live in a society that unborn children, theoretical children, are taken far more care of than real flesh and blood children and later adults who are already here. That's when I start thinking the issue is a little nebulous but um, and a hypocritical. So there's one of my favorite unmade projects that I've wanted to make for a long, long, long time is based on a book that deals with reproductive rights. And it comes out of from very different, different perspectives. And I've always been interested in that. And I think reproductive rights are a, a hot button issue now that science fiction is a great way to, to look at and examine those issues. And I think anybody that thinks that when they tell me that they don't all, oh, we don't, we don't want to discuss politics. I'm like, what, you don't want to, you don't want to develop your intellect. Science fiction especially as a genre, has always been political and it's always addressed political issues, but just in a, in a fun way. And, and I think that the problem is that the problem that I have is that when we can't, when we can't discuss these ideas because we want to believe that if somebody's just wrong, how can somebody be wrong when you've got millions of people that believe the same way? I was having this discussion with somebody just the other day. If you live out in Los Angeles and you live here on the coast, it's not, we're not a bunch of Hollywood elites or libtards or whatever. California's got a very diverse population with a lot of diverse political ideas. But living in California is very different than, say, living in the Midwest. When I went up to this uh, um, science fiction convention when I was a guest of honor in Fort Collins, the lifestyle in Fort Collins, Colorado, was very different than here. And, and we have to remember that America is a wildly diverse place, both in terms of, of demographics and in terms of just the experience of the world. Now, while we're bound together by the Constitution, our experience of life, depending on where you live in the United States, can be very different. And we have to remember that. You know, we have to remember that when we're having these, these conversations, you shouldn't yell and scream at people who are bringing points up. We should be discussing the ideas and trying to understand why do people have the thoughts they have, how does that relate to where we're coming from, and what, where are we not, where's our impasse happening? And one of the great things about science fiction, fantasy, and horror as a genre is that the genre has allowed people that don't necessarily, wouldn't maybe get along because of their viewpoints, but they can both like Star Trek or Star Wars or comic books, the MCU, Harry Potter, what have you. You can come from these things from both sides of the aisle, and and that's where I would hope discussion can begin, can flower. You know, democracy can flower from these things. And you know, it bums me out when when we're talking about things that we love, and then we start going after people individually when they're bringing up their various viewpoints. And I think it's really important to try and understand where people are coming from without writing them off, because. Their opinions, while we might not agree, and indeed, I think there's a lot of people that have wrong opinions, but it doesn't mean that I want to discount them and not let them be heard. We should have a debate and be able to discuss any issue. That's what we're all about. That's what uh, America is all about. That's what that's what um, that's what that's what great about democracy. Willow Yang, Willow, I got a letter from Willow Yang by the way. It's coming. Willow, your letter's coming. Willow says, what's your opinion on Wesley? He needs to be brought to justice for all the innocent plants that he murdered on Edo. <laughs> yes, he, well, he, he almost was. God, after watching the original series, I would love, see, this is why I would love to sit down with you one day, Willow, because I would, we, I, I would love to hear your keen mind um, after watching the original series, go back and try and analyze an episode like Justice. And not only is it a crazy episode, but then you've got the omnipotent godlike entities as well. And it's just so strange, such a weird thing, but it's almost embarrassing that uh, you're, you have these things inflicted upon you. But interesting, isn't it? I think Wesley was a, uh, Wesley was named after, of course, Gene Roddenberry. I think Gene Roddenberry saw Wesley as a proxy for him, but he was never very well written and was definitely problematic in the show, but he's used better later, like the episode I cited, The First Duty. I think The First Duty 
is a fine, fine, fine episode of Star Trek. In fact, one of Next Generation's best episodes, and it is a Wesley episode. I won't tell you anything about it because I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's a fantastic episode of Star Trek, uh, and Wesley worked well there. Uh, Stephen Foley is here. Stephen Foley says, hey, Rob, did you see the trailer for The Irishman? Uh, I loved it. Of course, this is the long being long in production, Martin Scorsese's new movie that deals with Jimmy Hoffa, and you've got Al Pacino, Joe Pesci, and Robert De Niro in the film, and they use de-aging technology because it spans a number of decades, and the trailer dropped today. Netflix made it, and I cannot wait. Cannot wait. Looks fantastic to me. Uh, so yeah, I'm very, very excited. Jacob Baker says, wow, Jacob, well, first of all, thank you for that, uh, the generous support of the channel. Jacob says, hey, Mr. Burnett, first time super chat. Today marks the death of UV, the digital media service. Meanwhile, I have the Best Buy uh, KTOM uh, Knights of the, wait, what, why am I not, why, oh, 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 um, the Best Buy KTOM and Avengers 4 movie set Steelbooks pre-ordered. Next is the Criterion Godzilla Showa era set. Um, uh, yes, KTOM is king of the monsters. <laughs> anyway, first of all, Jacob, you and I park our space shuttles, our shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay. Because, I, you know, I didn't order uh, King of the Monsters. I didn't order the Steelbook. I, I don't necessarily collect Steelbooks. I like Steelbooks. I don't collect them. I Like my, my, like my man Cliff, Cliff Stevenson, he of Off the Cliff Productions, who does phenomenal behind-the-scenes special features. He's been steadily working while some of us, like me and Charlie DeLazarica, haven't been doing as much work. But I, you know, I do love Steelbooks. I, I forgot, uh, I forgot I ordered the Humanoids from the Deep Steelbook. Now, people would say, why do you? I talked about B-movies yesterday. I love this movie. I love Humanoids from the Deep. Uh, it's, it's pretty gonzo. It has a great James Horner score that sounds a lot like Star Trek II, believe it or not. Um, and it's it's a great exploitation movie. You know, you've got to love a movie where a giant fish man has his way with a giant, uh, not a giant, a giant fish man has his way with a, a hot blonde and, and that carries through to the end of the movie. There's ramifications that happen at the end of the film. I don't want to say what it is, but as far as B-movie exploitation cinema goes, you can do a lot worse than humanoids from the deep. This was always a favorite movie to show girls because the end of the movie is so horrifying for them. Uh, I have I ordered the Endgame Steelbook. Uh, I needed the Endgame Steelbook because I got the Infinity War Steelbook. And it's funny, once I posted a picture, I think it was before Infinity War, of my Marvel collection, the O-ring, the outside, uh, this is an O-ring. That's retail speak. This is an O-ring. So my O-ring for Thor The Dark World, somehow the glue let go, and it got trashed. And I had all my Marvel movies lined up, and they all have O-rings except that one, and people were taking me to task. They're like, my OCD wouldn't allow that. So I'm going to be happy to be getting Thor The Dark World in 4K. So not in the steelbooks, but at least so I can have the O-rings. But um, yeah, so you know, we talked about this on the John Campy show that Ultraviolet, which was a digital media service, you used to be able to have digital streams, or or you could uh, you could get UV copies. Ultraviolet went out of business, but if you you were able to move over your your movies to uh, different services, they gave you advance notice. But yes, uh, and also something that Jacob is talking about the Showa Godzilla, the Showa era Godzilla movies. That was the original Godzilla continuity. And Criterion is releasing a box set of 15 Godzilla movies on Blu-ray, which I can't wait for. Anyone who has the Zatoichi set that Criterion put out knows that they're going to knock it out of the park. And I think that goes up through Terror of Mecha Godzilla. I'm not really sure, but here's what bums me out. I will say this. What bums me out about this era, you've got Godzilla versus Mothra, but what's not included because it's probably licensed to someone else is like, of course, Mothra. This is the Steelbook of Mothra that came out recently. Um, that's not in the show set, but what's really not in the show set that bums me out is Rodan. Rodan is my favorite show era monster movie, kaiju film. Uh, my favorite kaiju movie of that era is Godzilla Invasion of the Astro Monster or Godzilla vs. Monster Zero. I can't wait to get that on Blu-ray. I can't wait to get this box set. It's it's going to be great. Um, so, Jacob, thank you again for supporting the channel. Very, very much appreciated. And 
I, I'm going to have to go, you know what, you made me, I'm going to have to go look into the Knights, uh, Knights, King of the Monsters, King of the Monsters, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, uh, Best Buy Steelbook. It's probably sold out. Koba's here. Koba says, I will never be a Borg. As a massive Doctor Who fan, I surely will become a Cyberman first. Well, Koba, I would like to see an ape Borg or an ape Cyberman. I think that would be cool, but I understand. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that the Borg are kind of bargain basement ripoffs of the Cybermen. I can't say I disagree. Stubble McShave's here. Stubble McShave says, O'Brien and Bashir have the best friendship arc in Star Trek. They started as antagonists and ended up as best friends. Love their campaign against the Germans. I love the friendship that developed between Dr. Bashir and O'Brien. I agree with you. Uh, seeing them in the holodeck or when they would come out of the holodeck, playing their games. Uh, I love that. The Alamo against the Germans, all of that stuff. I think you're absolutely right. I loved that about Star Trek Deep Space Nine, uh, which is such a good show. Uh, it takes a while to get into, I know. People are always saying, well, I, you know, it took me a while to get into it. I get it. But, um, yeah. So this is a letter. That, <laughs> this is a letter from a guy who writes me all the time. And and uh, if I read every one of his letters, I, 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 I could do a whole show and just read his letters. But I'm going to read one of his letters today. His name's Aaron Johnson. He writes me all the time. I want to say thanks, Aaron, for being a longtime viewer and a member of the Post Geek Singularity community. And uh, thank you for all your letters, buddy. <laughs> There's sure a lot of them. Hey, Rob, the other day you mentioned in one of your talks about the Lion King. This letter is my opinion involving the animated Lion King. While I do have joy for the movie, one scene boggles viewers, the argument scene. The idea that Simba and Nala had argued because Simba felt guilty about Mufasa alarms me. And while I do find joy for the rest of the animated Lion King, seeing this scene brings up this topic. If Simba and Nala resolve their issues, similar like in Robin Hood, where Robin talked it out with Maid Marian, then one of the things that might have made things better is maybe Simba would be quiet and Nala would make a reasonable speech about why it is important to have a stable relationship. <laughs> Once Nala was done with her speech, Simba would say something positive rather than letting the preconceived notions of Scar scare Simba. It would result in the exact same scene involving Mufasa's ghost, but with Nala present with Simba and reassuring him, and it certainly would have had a positive outcome similar to Robin Hood, and that it probably would have included other things and in that it would have helped stabilize Simba and Nala's relationship, like Nala saying she loves Simba, and a wedding scene before that ceremony scene at the end of the movie. There are other couples and other TV shows and movies. They probably have stable relationships and friendships. So my question is, do you think Simba and Nala's relationship is somewhat a little unstable at times, unlike other movie and TV characters that have stable relationships? <laughs> thank you. Sincerely, Aaron Johnson. Well, first of all, Aaron, I want to say once again, thank you for writing uh, so often. I really appreciate that. A good question. You know, I, I don't I don't presume to know what it's like to have a relationship in Africa when you're being faced with predators and the African veldt and all of the other animals in the kingdom every day. It's got to put undue stress on any relationship. But Nala and Simba, you know, remember, The Lion King is a story about a young man learning to become a leader, basically learning to become king and becoming worthy of being king. So... Uh, one of those things is interpersonal relationships and you can't be a good king without a great queen. And I think all of the story of the Lion King is we're, we're seeing the, the development and the maturity of, well, in this case, a lion that is developing through the relationships he's having with other people. Uh, Timon and Pumbaa, look at that. Look at how, how he go, kind of goes off on a on a, I guess, like the Aboriginals might have called it a walkabout. It wasn't so much a walkabout, but because he wasn't coming back at the time. But it's, I, I think that whole movie has a lesson to teach all of us, boys and girls, about maturity and growing up. But uh, I don't think it's the most stable of relationships, nor should it be, because if it was stable, then Simba wouldn't learn anything. And as everyone knows, uh, there's a lot to be learned. There's a lot to learn from the women in your life, whether they're your mother, whether they're your friends, or whether they're your lovers or significant others. Women have a lot to uh, to teach us, and uh, we we would be we would be it would be we would do well to listen. And I think that uh, that's part of what Lion King is about, and I think it's good. 
This one comes from Victor Acosta. And this letter is hashtag Willow. Yeah. Oh, no, that's not what it says. Uh, hey, Rob, you recently did a chat about the importance of canon and continuity with regards to storytelling. And that got me thinking. As you know, the CW DC Universe shows are going to reenact Crisis on Infinite Earths as part of their annual crossover shows. So here's my simple question. Do you think Greg Berlanti and company will actually rewrite their continuity as part of this event, mimicking what actually happened in the comics? Or will they instead play it safe and just hit a reset button at the conclusion of this mega event, basically making it completely inconsequential? Would love to hear your thoughts about this. Also, I'm still working on that Willow Yang letter. No, Willow, I have not forgotten. The crusade will continue. But that's a letter for another day. Feel free to share this letter with the rest of our geek brothers and sisters, Rob. P.S. Loved Sophie and Elizabeth on the show. You should bring them on the show more often. Those San Diego Comic-Con videos were excellent. Well, Victor, thank you. I'm sure Willow is either cringing in terror, crying into her cup of tea, or, you know, she's ready. She's ready. Uh, ready to hear. But I want to thank you for that. You know, I think if they're calling it Crisis on Infinite Earths, I think they're going to change their continuity. I think it's going to be one world at the end. So everybody can interact on the same plane of existence. I want to see Black uh, Black Lightning and Supergirl on the same planet, you know, all, all together. And I think that's what they're going to do. I mean, with Arrow and the Flash ending, why not? Bring in more characters all on a single Earth. Because after all, that's what they did. I think that's the expectation. I think you're absolutely right about that. I want them to do that. I think that would be a lot of fun if they did that. Because why not? Why shouldn't they do it? Um, and speaking of Willow Yang, Willow Yang is into house, yo. Uh, but I'm going to let you hang on that for a minute. I'm going to see what anybody else has to say, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see what we can see because Willow's is, is not reviewing anything. But you know, uh, Sign Cassandra, one of my favorite names that I see in these chats. Sign Cassandra says, "So true. Thank you, and keep the discussion going." I don't know what you're actually referring to, because I always want the discussion going, but I want to thank you for supporting the channel, as you do. Uh, was that referring to Stubble McShave's discussion or, or something before that? Um, but yes, thank you, Sonic Sandra, because what a great name that is. Uh, this next letter, ladies and gentlemen, yes, Willow Yang is in the house again. And uh, here, here is Willow Yang. She's not reviewing an original Star Trek episode, but it's a good letter nonetheless. Greetings, Rob. Almost as an adjunct to my report on Is There in Truth No Beauty, I'm writing my thoughts about debate over films, television, and any other forms of art. Small subject. In the past, I've admittedly been dishonest at times about my opinions. If the majority of an audience loves a movie, I often feel compelled to pretend to love it in order to avoid appearing stupid, and the same goes for the reverse. These days, however, I have learned to be more open and truthful about my thoughts. I personally believe that there is no right or wrong way for a person to react to a film, and having a diversity of views is a crucial and wonderful part of being human. Couldn't agree with you more. I've had a long-standing fascination with writing. When I first came to Canada, my mom would make me write stories and essays every day in order to improve my English. She would read them, and if she was dissatisfied with my work, she would make me revise it until it was up to her standards. Of course, I had no choice on the matter. I wasn't allowed to watch my Pokemon until I had placated my mom first. One criterion that she'd always judge me on was the number of big words I used. In order to impress her, I'd often look up a thesaurus, or I'd often use a thesaurus to look up sophisticated sounding terms. Over the years, however, as I grew more familiar with the English language, as I watched more movies, as I listened to people talk, as I read more literature, I came to realize that the quality of writing isn't dependent on how many pretentious terms it contains, nor is it dependent on the lengths of the sentences, the diversity of words, the number of adjectives and adverbs. None of these criteria seem sufficient to measure the quality writing. Of course, you can't just string words together randomly. There are rules to sentence structure and grammar that must be followed in order to produce something coherent. However, a piece of writing can be perfectly grammatically correct and yet still fail to evoke the intended response in a reader. I can't rationalize this, but sometimes I just like the way a sentence sounds. 
I know that this is not a perfect comparison, but I do draw parallels between our taste in art and our taste in food. There is definitely universality in human taste. Our primal brain is predisposed to respond to salt, sugar, and fat, a trait that many food industries have, unfortunately, exploited in recent decades. For instance, in practically every society throughout history, sweet foods, whether it's honey or fruits or sugarcane or modern-day confectionaries, are considered pleasant to the human tongue. However, if you were to take a poll from everyone as to what their favorite food is, you'll get a myriad of different answers. We do share commonality in our taste for food, but in that commonality, there is still great variation. Our genetic makeups are different. The environments and cultures we grew up in are different. The stages of life and physiological changes we're undergoing are different. Every person is gonna to react to the same food differently. There are freaks of nature, like my parents, for instance, who hate chocolate. Can I tell them they're wrong because chocolate is high in sugar and fat, as well as a host of other chemicals that's supposed to trigger the release of endorphins in your brain? I like the scent of cilantro. In China, we call it zhangkai, 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 which literally translates to fragrant, fragrant vegetable. However, I know there is a portion of the population who finds cilantro soapy due to variations in their olfactory receptor genes. Are they correct? Or am I correct? In my opinion, the answer is neither. I don't have any literary or film background, but I do believe there are scientific techniques to creating art, just as there are techniques to food engineering and drug design. You can certainly analyze and critique the technical aspects of a film, and I can describe the structural properties of molecules of penicillin. But what does that tell you about the response that a film or drug will induce in an individual? Whenever you conduct experiments in vivo, your data will invariably get messy because life is messy. Even two identical cells from an isogenic population of bacteria can exhibit extreme variations in their response to a stimulant. Penicillin contains a beta-lactam ring that enables it to bind to proteins in the bacterial cell wall, arresting cellular growth. Since its, fortu since its fortuitous discovery by Sir Alexander Fleming, Penicillin has saved the lives of countless patients who'd otherwise have succumbed to infections, and yet there is a small faction of the population, Paul, pardon me, there is a small fraction of the population in whom the drug will induce fatal anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis, like anaphylactic shock. To them, penicillin is not a life-saving cure, but a deadly toxin. Are they at fault for responding that way, for having overactive antibodies? Art is in vivo. It is a stimulant that likely can never be measured inside a carefully controlled test tube and is hence subject to a million different variables that will affect the outcome of its effects. Every person's body and mind are uniquely programmed by genotype and environment and cannot possibly respond to stimuli in the exact same manner. I won't disparage a person for having an unpopular opinion on a movie any more than I will disparage them for having an adverse reaction to a food or drug that has worked for other individuals. And in the end, it doesn't matter to me if someone disagrees with me on film because I believe that variation is the key to our existence. It is variation that has enabled us to diverge from the rest of the homonymy, homonymy, homin, homininy. I know what you're saying, the hominid population, that's the plural of hom, I don't, homin, homininy, ninny? Is that right, homininy? I can't imagine it is, but homininy, millions of years ago. It is a variation that has enabled us to survive predators, disease outbreaks, and famines. And it is variation that enables us to respond to and enjoy different pieces of art. Films, novels, and paintings can certainly be analyzed and critiqued, but they should also be experienced and perceived through the lens of every unique individual. Our diversity is, in my opinion, the true beauty of life. A number of years later, long after my mom had stopped forcing me to write, I overheard a conversation between her and my dad. She had apparently been snooping around in my room, as she often does, and has come across a short essay that I had written for an English class. In it, I discussed the meaning of the American dream by recounting my own parents' decision to immigrate in the hopes of obtaining a better life for me. I think it's very good, she told my dad in Chinese. I can't explain why. She didn't use any big words. I was just moved reading it. I don't remember what my teacher thought of that essay, what their response to it was, what grade they gave me, but I still remember my mom's words. 
Yours sincerely, Willow. Well, Willow, once again, I have to say that that you you move me with your words, and I hope that the rest of you guys in the post geek singularity community are moved. This is why I like doing these chats because Willow and others write me letters where they share the they share of themselves like this, and also in Willow's case, she brings up a good point. However, I do want to sort of uh, point out one thing. While everybody is different, I think that there's certain things uh, in evolution, certain traits are more desirable to have, and they get passed along, and that's that's what we get if you look down uh, the evolution of an organism. Uh, genetic traits that are stronger are passed along. And I do think for the majority of people, that is true. Uh, there's only a certain people, a certain group of people, small group, that find penicillin to be toxic. So there is a majority of something that is 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 more desirable or correct. And I think when it comes to art, and especially storytelling, there are certain rules that are unquantifiable as of now because the way we could measure them is beyond our comprehension. We're going to need supercomputers even beyond what we have now to figure out what all that is. And I do think that great stories universally if people have the education and they are at a certain place and they've, of course, grown up and, and had the kind of lifestyle they need and they're not just surviving for food, but they, they do have a certain level of education and intelligence, I think the great stories, whether they're literature or the great movies, uh, are great movies. And that was something that, in my own mind, I was always struck by when I went to film school, especially when I went to USC. There were a lot of classic movies I saw for the first time that I hadn't watched, like All About Eve and Sunset Boulevard. And these were movies that I know, as I think I'm a pretty astute movie watcher. I'd never seen these movies before. Frankly, for whatever reason, they didn't sound that appealing to me. But when I watched them, I was completely captivated by the films. Uh, All About Eve has become, actually both, All About Eve and Sunset Boulevard are two of my very favorite movies. And as far as storytelling is concerned, they are second to none. Now, a lot of people can't even watch them now because they can't deal with black and white films or the theatricality of things, but that isn't the movie's problem. I think that's a viewer problem. And uh, so I do think that there's a certain objectivism, uh, an objective uh, value to stories. Uh, I could be wrong, but I do think that there is. But what a great letter. And uh, that, bit of, that, that bit at the end with your mom... That just brought a tear to my eye. Uh, Nick Markins is here. Wow, Nick, thanks for the support of the channel. Nick says, hi, Rob. After watching your show last week about movies based on serial killers, I decided to buy the Hannibal Lecter Blu-ray box set on Amazon. Which film is your favorite? How are the movies different from the books? Well, that's interesting. I would assume that that, that, that Blu-ray set is the one that has Manhunter, uh, Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal in it. I don't know if it has Hannibal Rising. Um, all of those films are pretty, actually, to be honest, they're pretty faithful to the source material, kind of the same way that David Cronenberg's adaptation of The Dead Zone is faithful. The story's there, but there's a lot of richness and detail that are not in the films. And I love, I, I mean, you, there's, there's two versions of Red Dragon. Famously, well, actually, there's three if you include Hannibal. But since we're talking movies, there's been two versions of Red Dragon, which is the first Hannibal Lecter book. He's only a, he's, he, he basically gives a cameo in Red Dragon. One is Michael Mann's version that was made in, in uh, I believe it came out in 86. I think it came out in 86. If I'm wrong, it's 87, but 86. And then it was later remade by Brett Ratner. And Anthony Hopkins actually played Hannibal Lecter. In Red Dragon, Hannibal Lecter is played by Brian Cox. Now, the film, again, one of the great things about the book is how much it delves into psycho killer Francis Dollarhide and his life and his inner life. And by the way, the same is true of Silence of the Lambs. Um, Silence of the Lambs gets really into the psychology of James Gum and what he's doing and why he's doing it. And you learn a lot more about Clarice Starling. I mean, all of the, as a lot of movies are, 
And and Hannibal, the movie Hannibal, is is very similar to the book, but again, the details um, are are lost. But I think all three of those movies, and to a certain extent, the thing I I, I love Red Dragon. I mean, I, I love the book, and I love Manhunter. I didn't love Brett Ratner's interpretation of the movie as much, even though I loved Ray Fiennes. I didn't like Ed Norton. I, I I like William Peterson so much more than I liked Ed Norton as uh, as the character because as Will Graham because um, I, he just seemed William. I, I was coming off my William Peterson high of To Live and Die in L.A. and I love William Peterson so much. It was so great to see him in that movie, and I'm sure that's why CSI even got made was because of Manhunter in the first place. But I think all three or four, they're all very worthy adaptations of Thomas Harris's. Uh, book. To be honest, I can't speak to Hannibal Rising because I only watched half of it. I know it's terrible. I own it. <coughs> I own it now, though. I read the book, but the movie, I was like, eh. He clearly wrote that for money, which is, you know, I understand. Thomas Harris got to eat, too. But but I think that they're all great adaptations of the source material as far as that goes. They just don't have the detail. The books are very much worth reading. They're terrific reads, especially because of all the detail in them. So yeah, I really like those books a great deal, but I also like the movies. They're just not as, they're not as rich and not, not as detailed, but they are very much worth your time. And I really like, what did you think of the movies after all? I'd be curious. Have you watched them all yet? Um, what do you think? So, uh, Oh, James M has a post script. Uh, this is an interesting one. So this comes from James M. Postscript or prescript, pardon me, prescript. Throughout this letter, I refer to remakes, but I should clarify up front that the exact same idea can be applied to any new content, not just remakes. Last Wednesday, July 24th, the topic of backlash on non-male lead movies came non-male led movies came up on the John Campia show. So today I want to share a point of view a point of view that might explain why there is backlash against new remakes of old movies or shows without a straight white male, or at least the ones without straight white males as a main character with some intelligence, looking at films like Ghostbusters 2016. First, I should say, I know that there are trolls that hate on everything, so this is obviously not their point of view, but merely the point of view of the other people that complain. So why is there backlash? Well, I think it can basically be boiled down to one thing, our current culture. Nowadays, when a straight white man complains about new remakes without straight white men, he is first called things I will not write, then told, you always have the original so you can watch, so don't complain about this one. Besides, no one is forcing you to watch it. However, I've heard several people say that fewer and fewer people are re-watching programs, be it old or new, which creates a paradox. If it is true that fewer people are re-watching, then it would be logical that streaming sites will not keep something up on their site if it is not watched. And assuming that people have not bought the originals, then I would say most straight white men technically don't have the originals or even access to them anymore, and thus are stuck with the new remakes. This is why I think straight white men are complaining, because growing up we are told by our culture, don't watch the old programs, stated as if the older programs weren't available for us to view anyway, and that is until the complaining about the new programs when we are told to watch the old programs that we don't have, or worse, we are told to grow a pair, as if the snowflakes that demanded representation in the new content could not. Also, these same people forget there is old content that some of their, their that has these people forget that there's old content that has some of their representation. Movies like Cat Baloo and shows like Star Trek Voyager, though I've only seen the one and a half hour season one opener and the first normal episode, it seems that Catherine Janeway is a Mary Sue, to name a few. And as if it's representation people are demanding, where are the religious, conservative, libertarian, and many more? I live in the Bible Belt, so I know a lot of people that do not have representation in Hollywood, and I would love the chance to be included in any part of a movie or a show. But I understand it's pure economics. There are only X number of spots for any job, so to include others means that others have to be excluded. Honestly, I don't think most men want others to not feel or not be included, 
but instead the complete opposite. They want to be included. Please do not take this the wrong way. I'm all for inclusion, but I am first and foremost for good content and the survival of all content, be it good or bad, because everyone has a story to tell and all you have to do is listen. Robert Meyer Burnett, literally every day. Thanks for reading. P.S. I apologize for both the length of this letter and all of the grammatical issues it has. Feel free to edit it as you wish or read it or parts of it on your show. Well, first of all, you know, this is what I was talking about at the top of, of the hour. Um, I just want to say that, first of all, James, thank you for writing in. And I do like the fact, it, it means a great deal to me that all different kinds of people feel that they can write me whatever their political views are, whatever parts of the spectrum they fall on. That's what uh, this show is all about. It didn't start out that way. I, I did not know, by the way, that I was going to be the preacher of some kind of message of positivity. I am, am mostly a positive person. I have always been accused of always being happy all the time and, and, and always bouncing off the walls. And, and that might very well be true. Because I do believe that living in the post-geek singularity, there's so much I've always loved in my life that I'm surrounded by, if not drowning in. It's 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 not hard for me to to have a smile on my face and get excited about the world. Um, it really isn't. But what's interesting is is like I don't remember up until the last five years ever even hearing about these issues, you know, the uh, issues of of diversity. And I've always, I guess because I've always watched movies from all over the world, like for instance, it never occurred to me that um, Asian, there's not a lot of Asian representation in, in Hollywood movies. I, I knew that to be the case. That was just obvious to me because we were a predominantly white nation with a small, relatively small Asian population. But I grew up watching Asian movies in their original uh, language subtitled. So, you know, like I said, when they cast Tony Leung, my man, Tony Leung, who I dearly adore, you know, in the mood for hard boiled, hashtag in the mood for hard boiled, when they when they announced that Tony Leung was cast as the Mandarin, I'm sitting there going, oh my God, like that's the coolest thing to me. Like if I could be any Chinese dude, I'd want to be Tony Leung and look like him and wear his suits in the mood, in Wong Kar Wai's in the mood for love. I mean, that's a guy that I would want to be. So when they announce him, I'm thinking, yeah, man. Tony Leung is now going to be at the top of American uh, must-see lists, but but I understand that I, I'm I'm not that I'm unusual, but I am not the norm. You know, there's not a lot of people seeking out different. Uh, there's not a lot of people that watch foreign movies. Not, certainly not enough, and I get that. And I understand that if you're an Asian American or an Asian Canadian, in, in Willow's case, that the kind of representation you get over here is is different than you get in your native land of of china or japan or korea or, i mean i'm a huge fan of, of korean movies as well so i get all that and then when it comes to like gender issues um it's never really bothered me of course i grew up as a privileged white male so i was able to watch movies about stories about privileged white males my whole life and i and i really get what people are saying and i understand how all of a sudden See, I, here's the thing. Storytelling is, a, is an art form. And I think traditionally anyone who is an artist, not all artists, but a lot of artists, the idea of creating art is in itself a, a it's a pursuit that is inherently has certain, it's not, it is not conservative to pursue art. If you're a conservative, you're not going to necessarily produce art because making art is certainly not a conservative idea. It's, uh, it defines what liberal means. Liberal means you're open to new ideas and the fact that you're going to be putting something that's in your head on a canvas or you're going to write a story that doesn't necessarily exist. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't conservative artists or conservative writers because there certainly are. But the very act of that, if you're, go if you're going to lead a artistic lifestyle that isn't a conservative thing to do a conservative thing to do would be getting a more practical job where you know where your next paycheck is coming from so there's there's just different ideas that are surrounding storytelling and movies and art than say finance i'll give you an example 
Here's a, here's a real world example that will, will illustrate the difference. I am always trying to find people to fund movie projects. Putting your money into a movie project is inherently risky. You cannot guarantee a return on someone's money. You can't. However, if you've got $100,000 to invest, it's much easier to invest in, say, a real estate property, whether it's a building, whether it's a house. Let's say you invest your $100,000 in a consortium that's going to build a apartment complex or a mixed use retail space and apartment complex, they can tell you how many per square foot, how, how much rent is. So you can actually look on a spreadsheet how much you can pretty much guarantee the return on your $100,000 investment is going to be. Or you can invest your $100,000 in a movie where the people making the movie don't have any idea what's going to happen with your $100,000 investment. It is inherently a conservative idea to invest in real estate rather than invest in a movie. That's that's just reality. You know, and and I think that that uh, then again, so you you've got a dividing line of how people are are immediately thinking. So if you're a conservative person, you want to make sure that for instance, your values are going to get shaped by the fact that when you invest that money, you want to make sure that you've got the infrastructure to support that investment. Good roads, sidewalks, that means you want to have good policing. I mean, it, 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 there's a whole pragmatic thing that, that comes forth from being that kind of a person. I don't begrudge anybody that. I mean, it makes sense to me. I, I, would, I would say definitely if, if I, I, I'm more conservative about somebody's going to give me $100,000 to make a movie, I would be very conservative how that money is spent when it comes to doing that production. There's a lot of people profligate spending. I would be, I keep a very close eye on how much money is being spent on a project. I've learned to do that over the years, uh, and it's something that's very, very important. So I would say I'm a conservative when it comes to spending my film's budget. But trying to get somebody to give me that money initially is a crazy. It's crazy. You have to be like a patron of the arts, or you want to see your name in lights. There's no reason for anybody to invest in movies beyond in wanting to invest in movies. There's a lot of people that have a lot of extra money or they need to have a tax shelter or something. They need to, they'll need they give you 100 grand because they have to show a loss for the year, whatever it is. I know that, that based on the kind of people we are, we're just different. We come from different points of view. I'm not very religious. I have very good friends of mine who are very religious. I have family members who are very religious. We come at certain issues from very different standpoints, very different standpoints. And I suppose if we were to, we were going to discuss these things over dinner, we might get into some knockdown, drag out debates. I think the real problem is there are those people that will say that very religious people are idiots. I am not one of those people, and and this country was built by religious people and religious values uh, shaped our nation. So unless you can legitimately and as an adult discuss the fact that religion played a part in shaping our nation, it also played a part in making sure that we had separation of church and state because people were wise and they understood that these kinds of decisions were wrong. But what's happened is we've forgotten to have these kinds of cogent debates. We've forgotten. We're not intellectual people anymore. You know, we're, 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 we've become tribal and it, it's unfortunate because I, I listened to someone like John Kennedy give a speech about going to the moon. One of my favorite speeches, you know, we will go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. You've probably seen it a million times over the last month because it's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. It just seemed to me that the people used to understand they had the common sense. They knew that there was separation of church and state. They understood these things, you know, and, and, and they understood also that um, as we have learned how we pollute the environment and as runoff from uh, uh, factories and things are not necessarily good for the groundwater, we started to have regulation, which is smart because we, we live in a closed biosphere, so polluting the biosphere makes absolutely no sense at all. I know that that we have to make money. And what's really weird to me is that as we our populations grow and there's more of us and we have more plastic and we have more 
runoff and more coal and all this stuff, we have forgotten that we live in a closed system. Anyway, all of these belief systems, I'm, I'm going at, I'm off in the weeds. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. What you were saying is that in terms of movies that have female protagonists, I could care less whether you're going to give me an all female Ghostbusters and have the one male character kind of be a funny buffoon if the story and the characters are good. And, and what's really interesting is what I find disappointing in a lot of, if you're going to gender swap something, they tend to make the women not female. Like, like women and men approach problems from different perspectives. And if you are going to have a female Ghostbusters, I would lean in. I mean, I'm always fascinated to watch movies or read stories about women because especially written by women because I learned something and that's what I want from my entertainment I just want it to be I want to learn something but if you're going to gender swap something make the gender swap have meaning don't just don't just don't just turn a woman into a, another kick-ass male protagonist make her make her gender part of the story that you're telling you know make her 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 femininity like she's going to approach different things different than a male character and make the gender swap mean something show show me something interesting and that's that's what i want to see and unfortunately like okay i wouldn't mind telling stories about people that are more conservative but what's that story that you're going to tell are you going to tell the story about a person who would rather put his money in real estate because it's a safe bet or the crazy maverick like tucker who goes all in with his dream and his money and creates a car to go up against Detroit and all the big, the big uh, car manufacturers. Cause he's got a crazy dream and gets crushed by them. What movie is more compelling? I mean, that's not saying you can't make a, a, a movie about conservatives that aren't compelling, but I think inherently stories are more interesting when they're about dreamers, when they're about not conservative people, unless somebody who's conservative has some kind of a, a of an awakening and that's why frequently you look at footloose the conservative religious leader of the town is portrayed as a villain until basically the end when he comes to terms with his child i mean it's 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 an interesting thing it's an interesting way to to go about uh i don't know i've gotten way off the point i think but james i want to thank you for writing in uh the letter but but basically your point at the end uh when you talk about economics and why aren't there why aren't there more why isn't there more representation of religious conservatives libertarians and many more uh, you know i just i think that people would do more of those stories but storytelling is inherently not um it's just not friendly to if you're going to make a story about a religious person look the last mel gibson film uh, about the 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 conscientious objector in World War II based on his values. That was a great story about a religious man, his convictions. Uh, I can't wait to see the movie uh, with Tom Hanks playing Fred Rogers. Fred Rogers was a pastor, you know, and, and I think it's great that that movie's getting made. And I've, I've always been fascinated by movies about religious leaders, the silence, um, things like that. So I think they're out there, but... Um, when you say that you know a lot of people who do not have representation in Hollywood, I think inherently drama and and storytelling excitement has to come from more non-conservative routes. At least that's uh, that's what I would say because stories about conservative people uh, just don't lend themselves well to drama. Or, I mean, I could be wrong about that. I, I, I don't know. I know I'm kind of going off. Um, I, I, I've lost, I've lost my train of thought on this. But I like the letter, and I think your point is well taken. Oh, JB Bonifacio says, uh, "But R&B, what about Tapestry? I forgot that." Okay, yes, yes. For those keeping score, for I did forget to say Tapestry. Um, you know, I was just doing this quickly off the cuff. Tapestry is, of course, one of the great Picard episodes. And, you know, if you don't watch any of the other Q episodes, if you watch Encounter at Farpoint, Tapestry, and All Good Things, that pretty much says it all. And Q-Who, really, because you have to watch Q-Who. But... So you're right, JB. That was a that was a, a serious omission from my list of Picard episodes to watch. 
I should have absolutely said tapestry. Shame on me. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't say that. that. Was thank you for pointing that out. See, I appreciate uh, when you point things out like that. And um, I think that 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 was very much very important that um, you brought that up. So thank you. This next letter comes from Jeffrey Mao. Jeffrey Mao says, hi, Rob. After watching Rob's observations and commenting several times, I've finally taken the plunge and joined the post-geek singularity. What took so long? Who knows? But I decided that I would try and write to you somewhat regularly, probably during my lunch break, as it seems the best time of the day to do so. Luke Beckett's email about canon and your response to it, which is pretty much in line with my thoughts, got me also thinking about canon canonicity and the creation and maintenance of a fictional universe. I know Luke was trying to be somewhat flippant about the rules of canon because it can oftentimes act as an albatross for creators, but I'm more on your side in wanting at least a decent amount of concreteness to both the canon and adherence to it by current and future writers of a franchise or a universe. My feelings about canon and establishing a rock solid universe is that if I were running a show, I'd hire a team of writers, lock them in a room, and don't let them out until they've written a huge Bible for me that basically details the whole universe, all of my races, my planets. I want to know their histories, their culture. I would want to know what they eat, how they poop, how they have sex, everything. That way, I give the book to my episode writers and say, follow this. Now, I know a lot of all shows already do that, but not to the extent that I want them to. I don't want to be making shit up as I go along. I want to have already done that. The way I will have all of my answers already available and I will ensure that there isn't a slip up. Now, I know the practical reason why this is not done is because it takes too long and costs too much money for a show that might not get past the first season, if not the first pilot. But I think all of us have watched something and said, wait a minute, that just contradicted something from last season. And this avoids that and all of those annoying retcons, like waving their hands and saying Chekhov was assigned below decks during Space Seed and therefore had met Khan. <laughs> That's the Star Trek II thing. The other thing that has also got me thinking about canon is the explosion of YouTube channels, mostly for Star Wars, but also for other universes that provide excessively detailed explanations for all sorts of things that you never thought you needed to know, especially the why questions. I hate why questions because I just want to comment all the time because that's what the writer wanted. Yeah, we all want a really strong canon and pretty well held together universe, but ultimately we're talking about fiction. I think when you examine a universe too closely, that only serves to reveal its flaws. And I feel that with the Star Wars universe, it is one of the mo more poorly developed universes as much of it was done well after the original films and not under the guidance of Lucas. I think there was a desire to imbue Star Wars with a rich, millennia-old canon a la Lord of the Rings, but when you do it well afterwards, it only serves to raise more questions and answers. Like, for example, why, is hyperdrive, why has hyperdrive existed for thousands of years, but the rest of technology has barely moved forward? Also, I feel a lot of these sites act as apologists for the canon instead of taking a critical eye to it. I'm critical, but that's because I want them to do better and make a better effort of it than the kind of slapdash effort up to now. I think the creators of Star Wars have been and are very lazy when it comes to your favorite word, verisimilitude. For example, naming a ship class using Greek letters, calling Snoke's guards the Praetorian Guard. Um, where in Star Wars is there Rome? Hell, even using the word Falcon. When's the last time you saw Falcon in Star Wars? But the one thing that really bugs me is language. For example, apparently you can convert words written in Arabesh directly into English. Now, don't get me started on Arabesh, as that's one of the most ridiculous fictional alphabets I've ever seen, but it just makes my gums bleed that they can be so lazy as to not even construct a fictional galactic standard language. When Game of Thrones can construct multiple fictional languages, Star Wars looks pretty darn lazy in comparison. Even the whole hugs hux joke in The Last Jedi makes no sense because in the Star Wars universe, the word for hug would be something totally different in my mind and therefore that joke wouldn't make any sense. 
when people watch Star Wars, they have to realize they're watching events unfolding on a completely different galaxy than the real care and that the real characters aren't speaking English. It's just like when we watch a movie set in a foreign country and everyone speaks English, but we know they're not actually speaking English. We're collectively suspending our disbelief and just accepting it. I've even thought that the humans that we see in Star Wars don't actually look like real Earth humans. The reasons why they look like humans in the movies is because it would take too much makeup for every actor as humans are the most populous species and would often be most seen. This rationale is the logical extension of when we see unrelated actors playing family members. Of course, they try and cast actors who sort of look alike, but most of the time they go for talent over similarities and features. We all then suspend our disbelief over that. So if we can suspend our disbelief about a group of actors playing family members, why can't we do that for a whole race of beings? I don't know if you've ever had similar thoughts, Rob, but you've watched and read way more stuff than I have, and I'm sure it's crossed your mind a few times and the other folks here. Take care and see you in the singularity. Jeff M. Jeffrey Mao. Well, Jeffrey, what a great letter. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, I puzzle over verisimilitude all the time. And I think, you know, when I was a kid, when I was a little kid, the first time I was aware of this was Star Trek. There were two things in Star Trek that even as a kid bugged me. Everywhere they went, everybody spoke English. And every planet they landed on, they only had to go to one city. Wherever they landed, it was the center of the entire civilization. I mean, I always, even as a kid, like when I was six years old, even that bugged me. Because I would think to myself, I'm like, man, if I rolled up onto Earth, you know, and I expected to go to the seat of power, whether it was Moscow or Washington, D.C., or where, like, New Delhi, where Tokyo, whatever, around the world, how come every time they beam down to a planet, they beam down to the most important place and find the most important people? I mean, sometimes they know, like when they're going to a Meniar and Vendikar, when they're visiting a Meniar, they know where they're going to, to the seat of power. But if they didn't know, if they're coming up to a planet they didn't know, it always bothered me that basically wherever they landed, whatever town or whatever city they landed in, that represented, that was a proxy for the whole planet. That used to bother me in the fact that everybody spoke English. And I understand because no one, especially Americans, uh, if you're going to have a weekly television show in the 60s, they're not going to make every alien planet speak in some alien language, so you have to read subtitles. They weren't going to do that. So I get that. But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when I talk about verisimilitude, that, as much as I love Star Trek, there's a lot of things that don't have verisimilitude. And and I, I'm with you 100%. I mean, the Star Wars universe, I think you're absolutely right about that, too. Um. All of this retconning, like, look, Filgrin Dan and the modal nodes is the, uh, Filgr Fil Fil is it Filgrin or Figrin? Fil I think it's Filgrin Dan and the modal nodes is the name of the band playing in the cantina in Star Wars. Well, that's not canonical. Not when you first saw the movie. No one knew what the name of that band was. And then, of course, when they make action figures, they come up with some name. They make it up after the fact. And I think you're absolutely right about Star Wars. All of its canon is made up after the fact. They're not basing it. It's not like somebody has a copy of the Journal of the Wills and they're taking everything out of there. It's all made up. And, and as, in the case of Star Wars, because it's so beloved and there's so much of it, people put up with it. And then somebody says, yep, Steve Sansweet puts it in his encyclopedia. This is canonical now, even though it's not. You know, And it's just strange to me. I mean, I stink, still think that uh, IG-88 was about to take over the second Death Star when it was destroyed in Return of the Jedi because I read Tales of the Bounty Hunters. Is that is that canonical? Probably not. But still, I, you know, I agree with you. I, I think it's a little crazy. But it's also kind of fun. You know, the more you read about this stuff, the more canonical it becomes. Star Trek was the same way for me. Every time I'd read something like the Star Trek space flight chronology, I would incorporate whatever I learned in that book into my head canon of Star Trek, even though then Star Trek, the next generation comes out. And, and, and what I don't like is when the canon in my own head is supplanted by worse canon, which is two seasons of Star Trek Discovery. All they did was change established canon, changing Sarek, changing... Uh, Michael Burnham and how Vulcans can communicate. It's just how fast and far you can cross the galaxy. Uh, the, all the stuff with the Klingons. I'm just watching a show where where established canon was just thrown out the entire window all the time in every episode. And I, it wasn't good canon. It was all shitty, and I hated it. 
a spore drive. First of all, forget the fact that we don't even know what a spore drive is in the Star Trek universe. The idea of it was just stupid. There's no mushroom network that's in the vacuum of space. I, I hated that. But I think your letter, your point, Jeffrey, is very well taken. And I totally agree with you. Uh, pretty much 100% about that. And it's a tough one. It's a tough one when you when you get into into all that. But you know, it, it also is part of the fun of being a science fiction, fantasy, and horror fan when you talk about canonical things, which I think is uh, which I think is great. Um, <laughs> Koba's here. Koba says one thing about Ghost Ghostbusters: Walter Peck was right. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, uh, uh, William Atherton, who plays Walter Peck, who also was in Die Hard, was, and he also played Jerry, uh, the professor in Real Genius. William Atherton was one of the great smarmy bad guys in in the eighties and nineties. Everyone loved William Atherton, and I noticed uh, I was watching episode five, episode four and five of The Expanse, and I didn't look at the credits but the 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 um there's a professor in the expanse that's working on the proto molecule and is 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 work experimenting on children and i was like i was like that guy looks so familiar to me and i it's his last name is atherton now it looks like william atherton's like younger brother but maybe it's his son uh but i think it's cool that that an atherton was was an evil scientist on io in the expanse uh, so Walter Peck, he was right in Ghostbusters. You're right about that, Koba. He absolutely was. Totally was. And um, yeah, I I totally agree with you. So yes, it's true. This next letter comes from longtime viewer and longtime member of the Post Geek Singularity, Mark C. or Mark Chure. And uh, this is another, I have liked Mark's letters and I, I know that a lot of people have taken umbrage to some of the things that he said but he initially came here and he felt that um that he uh uh you know sometimes doesn't feel as welcome as he should but this is not about that it's an interesting letter and i i i, I love getting this so mark c says greetings notorious rmb i wanted to start this letter with owning of a problem that has come to light over the weekend as a supporter of the Fandom Menace and Comics Gate, by the way, speaking of the Fandom Menace, I watched uh, a video of world class bullshitters that made me want to punch my screen, and it was a, a video about um, uh, uh, is anybody excited for the rise of Skywalker? And it really, I just anyway, everything I hated about the Fandom Menace, and, and sometimes I have liked videos, world class bullshitter videos, but this video I wanted just. I really want to throw my screen out the window. But anyway, as a supporter of the Fandom Menace and Comicsgate, I have preached that these loose groups of people are not toxic. We just approach an issue from another perspective that we find upsetting when looking at today's genre media. As you imagine, these two groups overlap a lot. Over the weekend, it has come to light that a particular YouTube channel called War Campaign, I've never heard of that, has taken things to a level most are uncomfortable with. It was it was thought that they were just a LARP group that took to social media, memeing and poking, poking fun at the far left idealists. We've learned that they have gone far beyond what they say they've been doing. Not all of them, but enough. And doing so in Ethan Van Skyver's name without his knowledge and certainly not his consent. While I have had nothing to do with them, if you have been harassed by the group, you have my apologies. Uh, I don't know that I have been. Uh, at least I don't recognize them. That said, I want to address what I read in the chat on Friday. My side of the aisle has plenty of ugly names and harassing phrases for progressive liberal liberals. I have never used any of these in the chat or described anyone here with them. I have listened to your point of view and treated you with respect. I have attested that we aren't the toxic fans but that the response received from progressives have, have been where toxic ideas have been bred. To a few of you, thank you for proving my point. You should be ashamed. Now for something a bit more geek related. After listening to Campy's stream yesterday, I have to 100% agree with you, Rob. I want Disney Plus for reasons most don't. I watch it to follow 
I watch. I wanted to watch Follow Me Boys and Guy William Zorro and all the classic Disney animated shorts that the Disney Channel hasn't run in 20 years. Do you remember Dr. Sin, a.k.a. the Scarecrow with Patrick McGowan? Man, I love Dr. Sin. I love the Scarecrow with Patrick McGowan. Or the Swamp Fox with Leslie Nielsen. What about Hot Lead and Cold Feet? Of course. Everything except the new original series I own on physical media. Let's cross our fingers that the older movies and shows hit the service sooner rather than later. Lastly, I would like to repost a question. With Fathom Events showing Star Trek The Motion Picture in September, is there any news of the director's cut getting a remastered Blu-ray release? Thanks, Mark C. Well, Mark, first of all, um, I appreciate you calling us, some of us out, including me. Uh, I, I Look, I, I think we need both sides of the political aisle, all sides of the political aisle. And I've always appreciated your commentary and your, your, your thoughtful letters. And you have more than once told me that you've appreciated the fact that I read your letters on the show and that you appreciate this being a welcome environment. And I think, look, as we get more people here and, and more thoughts, we're going to get a little bit more cantankerous and things are going to get a little, little ornery. I, that's to be expected. But at the end of the day, like you pointed out, you know, I want people to share ideas. And I think that getting ideas from one place is always dangerous. It's always better to get more diverse ideas from people. Um, I don't know what happened with the, this group uh, war campaign. The problem is, though, Mark, to be honest, I mean, I, I have seen a lot of name calling and a lot of really disgusting sexist and misogynist behavior coming from fandom menace channels and fandom menace people. There's, they're not the only ones. And I, I find it a little silly. And I do, as I started saying this whole chat, I do find it interesting. Like one of my, my, my new pet peeve, and I've been called this on social media lately, is, is being called access media. I freaking hate that term. I get what it means. Like if I'm access media, then I get access to interviews with celebrities or filmmakers or whatever. I am not media. I don't work for a media company. I am a, I am an editorialist, if anything, a vlogger, certainly. But I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm not trying to curry favor with anybody to get to get interviews. If I want to get interviews with people, there's a lot of people, well-known people, I can probably just call up and say, hey, man, come on my show. You know, the other night, I went to a SIGGRAPH event with my friend Michael Davis. Some of you might remember Michael Davis. He wrote and directed a movie called Shoot 'Em Up with Clive Owen and, and Monica Bellucci and, and Paul Giamatti. He also made a wonderful independent movie where he introduced the world to Kerry Russell called Eight Days a Week. He's a guy that would come on my show. He spent the last five years making a an eight-part animated series that he has hand animated himself. It's called Nixed, and it's crazy. It's a political satire tale, and it's amazing. So he and I... You know, he and I went out. Now, if I had him on his, on the show to talk about his new, it's, if I had him on this show that you're watching now and had him talk about his new um, show, I might be accused of being access media. But the thing is, I'm not trying to curry favor with anyone. Certainly, my opinion on Star Trek Discovery does not endear myself to Paramount, even though two good friends of mine, Shauna Benson, who I was on Starship Smackdown with, and her sister, Julie, who are TV writers. They also wrote Arrow for a while, the comic. They were just hired to write the new Nickelodeon Star Trek show. Uh, I can't call Shauna Benson up and expect to get a job on a Star Trek TV series, even if it's animated, because I'm, I'm never going to get hired. So I can't stand being called Access Media. And what's interesting is the, the people from the, the fandom menace, I, I hear that a lot from their channels. What they are doing by calling people Access Media is they're denigrating and dismissing all of the viewpoints those people have. And I strenuously object to that. It's that kind of, like it's one thing to state your opinion, but it's another thing by using certain phraseology to discount someone else's opinion that I can't abide. I hate that. And and I see a lot of that. Look, the progressive left, I'm, I'm becoming just as annoyed with them. I wanna punch people on my own side of the aisle out they're, they're, they're puritanical, they're ideological, ideologically fascist. And it's, it drives me crazy too. 
I mean, the whole point is to bring a place, uh, to create a place where we can talk, where you're not being labeled with things. Oh, you're access media, so I'm not going to listen to you. You know what's funny to me? I mean, the people that I work with at Collider or the people you know from Screen Junkies or things like this, that's their job. You know, what, what's interesting is, is people that are actually being paid to cover things, being paid their media, their media uh, people. They're being paid by larger companies to be reporters. That's what access media is, of course. And yes, they, when, when somebody from Collider or somebody from Screen Junkies or any of the other outlets are reporting, I would say they are access media because they're being paid to cover those things. And that means the studio is giving them access to their people and their movies and things like that. I understand. But, but what's happened in fan communities is a lot of these fan communities are seeing themselves as equals to other people that they perceive as being access media. Like, look, I don't work for another company. I work for myself. I do these chats. Uh, th th this, this entire enterprise, so to speak, is completely financed by support that I get from the viewers. If I wasn't getting support, I, I couldn't do this. I would have to go get, I'd have to go get a, a nine to five or nine to whatever, a regular job. Doing things like this allows to, me to support the work I do on Lucas Kendall's Sky Fighter because I normally would get paid as an editor a lot of money. But with independent films and the work, the realms that I'm working in now, I'm still doing those things and doing these chats allows me to keep going and build up the website and be able to interact with you guys while I'm looking for new work and while I'm looking to get my own projects off the ground. But a lot of these fan sites are not, they're, they're also professional sites. So I, I think a lot of anybody who turns on a YouTube cam thinks that they're equal to somebody that say works at Collider. Now I'm not saying they're unequal in terms of their opinion, but somebody who works for Collider, like I've known Scott Mans for years, but he's paid. He's a paid journalist, and he's been a paid journalist for years. And, and he's legitimately what you'd call access media. But I don't like the fact that the term is being used to denigrate people that are doing a job as opposed to people that aren't. You know, there's a lot of people making money in the fan YouTube space, and I don't begrudge them that. But um, if you're being paid by a bigger company, why? what's wrong with that? Why should you? Why should the slur of access media be used against you? It's driving me crazy. But I, you know, I hear a lot of that on fandom menace commentaries, like when I was watching that world class bullshitters uh, show, which and I watch those shows, man. World class bullshitters, what is it? Drunk C three PO, geeks and gamers. I watch those channels. You know, I stay abreast of that stuff, and a lot of the time they don't piss me off. I I enjoy hearing to the, hearing those opinions, but a lot of the time they do. I'm like, why do you have to say access media? You know, what does that mean? Of course, our media, when you say somebody's media, that you're presupposing they're getting paid. And our access media on one hand could be MSNBC, it could be Fox News, it could be CNN, it could be the BBC, whoever. But of course, that's how people are making their jobs. That's how they're making a living. So never begrudge somebody because they're working uh, for the media. That doesn't, this idea that, that, that we have professional fans and there's somehow people that should be shunned because they have a job. I mean, they're not like me. I can say whatever the hell I want. I don't need to curry favor with CBS right now. Um, I don't need to to try. I, I get a lot of people like, oh, there's CBS. I'll never hire you. I worked for CBS on two different occasions on Star Trek professionally. So uh, just because I don't like Star Trek Discovery doesn't mean that I'm, I mean, there's I, the reason I would probably never get a job for CBS is because I was involved with Axanar. That would be the one that would would do it but anyway mark i want to say thanks for writing in i do appreciate your letters and everything that you say both to me on a personal level and publicly here on the show so thank you for that um and i've saved a letter uh, uh, uh first of all let me see what else people have to say in the chat i saved a letter for last because it's pretty funny <laughs> Uh, Orville Nation. Orville Nation says, by the way, uh, it's pretty cool that for those of you who don't know, I mean, it's old news now, but the Orville uh, is no longer on Fox. It is on Hulu. There's going to be a little bit of a delay for season three, but Seth MacFarlane has been talking on social media how he's very excited that's going to allow them to broaden their horizons, uh, both with in terms of the show content and I think what they're going to do with the show character-wise, things like that. So that's really exciting. 
that um, that's happening. So Orville Nation says, Trek has inspired so many NASA scientists. They even named the first space shuttle after the NCC-1701. The lack of science in Discovery is disturbing. Orville Nation, I could not agree with you more. Uh, one of the things about Discovery that I really don't like is I don't believe it. <laughs> I, I don't if the, I don't believe in the, its non-existent fake science, and that bums me out. It bums me out. I disbelieve the science or the non-science in Discovery. It it drives me bonkers, but I think you're right. However, I do think you know there's going to be there's going to be people that grow up uh, that that are going to see you've got a, your first. There's the first same-sex relationship being depicted on a semi-weekly basis on Discovery. You know, and and that's there's going to be people that see that for the first time on TV, and that's going to be just as impactful as if you were a black woman in the late '60s or early '70s and you saw Lieutenant Uhura on the bridge of the Enterprise. Uh, there are things that we can't that we forget that have such an impact, and that's why, as much as I personally hate Discovery as a show, I can still recognize the fact that it's somebody's first time coming to Star Trek, and there's going to be impressions. Our own uh, Me talked about how she likes discovery and she's a very uh learned woman and i would not take her like of discovery away from her and there's going to be a lot of people just like her who do like the show for various reasons reasons i i don't even know nor could i speak to i'm just happy that there's a star trek out there that appeals to people now and it will lead them back to the 50 plus year rich history of the franchise and i hope they 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 see more of it a uh, servitor says here have some support <laughs> <laughs> well, Servitor, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that support uh, very much so. Wind Goddess says, Rob, I appreciate you and our community. Keep it up. Well, Wind Goddess, I thank you for that. Thank you for supporting the channel. And it means a lot to hear that from you guys and girls and gentle pe beings and non-binary people and aliens of all shapes, sizes, colors, and creeds, because that's what we are here for. So thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> this is the last letter I'm going to read today, but I this is pretty funny. <laughs> I'm going to try and read this letter how it was written. And this comes from Nance Ingoya. Nance Ingoya. <laughs> Greetings and felicitations, RMB. And that's spelled A-A-A-A-A-R-R-R-E-M-M-M-B-E-E. -E -E. RMB. I love that as a, like a word. You often muse that viewers of your streams come from all walks of life and are of all shapes and sizes. Guys, gals, gentle people, non-binary individuals, and even aliens. Well, guess what? I am what your kind would call an extraterrestrial being. That's right. I'm an alien hailing from a planet in the Epsilon, Epsilon, hailing from a planet in the Epsilon Iridani system. My name is, well, it's a bit difficult to write, as in my tongue, it would be a series of clicks and guttural noises. But the closest way a human like yourself can pronounce my name is, <laughs> is, nah, no, it's, Nansingoya Maba Githi Baba, i.e., from the first line of the intro song to The Lion King, sung in that exact manner. Nansingoya Maba Githi Baba. I think that's what you want me to say. Pleased to make your acquaintance. <laughs> My planet is about 3.2 parsecs from your own solar star, and thanks to a reception disk the size of your Australia in our equator, we were able to get transmissions from your planet. At first, my forefathers thought they were watching historical archives of your species' evolution, but they were subsequently confused as the archives seemed to show differing timelines, sometimes even futuristic ones, where humans have achieved interstellar travel capabilities. We know it's not true, as your lot are still stuck on the planet, burning primitive fossil fuels and sucking its resources dry. So we came to the realization that what we were watching were actually forms of entertainment available to your people. We're pretty advanced on our planet. All required day-to-day -day work are carried out by friendly autonomous robotic assistants known as cyber life organism neighbors 
So most of the time, we just chill in front of our interactive screens. One day, I downloaded a film called Free Enterprise via BitTorrent. Please forgive me for getting it through shady means, as it's not like Amazon delivers DVDs to our neck of the woods, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And that is how I came to know about you and your streams. Very informative. Like you, I enjoy your various forms of geeky entertainment. I especially enjoy the recent offering, The Last Jedi, which has to me, which to me has got to be the funniest comedy I've ever seen. Bombs falling in gravityless space, drinking milk straight from the tits of a ginormous creature by the seaside, the hero projecting himself as a hologram, then dying of exhaustion. All hilarious. I was laughing my ass off which on my body is located near my fourth elbow the whole time. I also love the futuristic adventures of The Discovery and especially enjoy the character of Burnt Ham. I love that the ship travels on mushrooms. We have a similar method with mushrooms here on our planet, although, un although usually it's more of an out-of-body travel experience rather than a physical one if you catch my drift. But its depiction of artificial intelligence is a bit of a stretch for me. As I mentioned above, we have autonomous robots carry out most of our chores and our scientists surmise that the possibility of them going rogue like the Discovery AI is practically zero. Anyway, to continue with your live streams, sanctimoniously notorious RMB, it's fun for one such as myself who is light years away to be a member of the post-geek singularity. Maybe if I can figure it out, I'll use the emerald lace platinum we have here in abundance on our planet to send you super chats and say hi. Oops, I have to make a move. I see an autonomous robot outside my door. Maybe it's a delivery or something, but there's like a big group of them carrying rakes and shovels. I wonder what the cyber life organism neighbor, or Cylons for short, want. Anyway, laters, your friend across the stars. Nancy Goya, Mama Giti Mama. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate hearing from anybody from the Epsilon Eridani system. Uh, I want to someday visit you myself. I think it would be great to hang out and see what's what. Um, but, and I, you know, I do appreciate, as I've said before, everybody who wants to support the channel via Super Chats or supporting the website at thebrunetwork.net, I do appreciate that as well. But, you do not have to do that. Uh, I just appreciate your opinions, and uh, thank you for making me sing your name like the Lion King. Mark C. Mark C. sends me a chat. Thank you, Mark, for supporting the channel, and I'm happy to have read your letter. Mark C. says, whether media or fan site, I spent a lot of time wading through plenty of videos that are just to create content to feed the algorithm. Totally agree. There's no blind allegiance to any one person's content. Look, man, I am right there with you. I, I mean, it's so weird in how the algorithms change. I'll tell you something that's, that's that happened. So I like a guy named Tim Pool. I watch a lot of Tim. I don't agree with him all the time, but I, I like watching his videos because he always comes up with topical stuff. He does like, I don't know, many videos every day. I like Tim Pool. And with my YouTube algorithm, I, I when I watch through my via my Amazon Fire Stick. I do what Elizabeth calls watching my clips. Well, my clips are YouTube clips, and they're there. You get the YouTube clips that are um, that the algorithm says you're most interested in. Last week, Tim Pool disappeared from my YouTube clips, and it was weird. He was just gone, and he didn't pop back up. And I had to literally go do a search. I did it yesterday, as a matter of fact, to find, I'm like, and, and started clicking more on Tim Pool videos. And even though I watched a bunch of his videos yesterday, they went away. Like I wasn't being, and I'm like, ah, I call shenanigans on that. And um, like you, I have no allegiance to one person's content, but there are people that I like to watch. And and it's very strange the, the way the algorithms work. Hell, my own live streams used to pop up all the time like whenever i do a live stream they would pop up based on my own analytics they don't pop up anymore like tim pool so you know that's why it's really important that people like if you like these chats to like them and to share them and whichever and 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 uh it's it's very frustrating to to not have i mean 
I, my chats, what's amazing about my YouTube channel is according to my analytics, I have a lot of retention. People watch, you know, for like 15, 20 minutes and that's pretty good. And, and I, I like the fact that we have a lot of audience engagement. I mean, I still, most of my videos, if they get three or 4,000 views, that's like a lot of views and, and that's fine. You know, I like the engagement level. It's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to do. And, um, but again, I, I think it's really strange. YouTube analytics are, are strange. And I do think that there is a concerted effort to make sure that only one side uh, is heard from. And it's frightening. And when you watch The Great Hack, which I think you should all do, and look, I give it up to Cambridge Analytica for doing what they did. They were really smart. And uh, we are always victims of our own, putting our own data out there. We're, we're our, our content just being us is the most valuable data of all, and we're giving it all away for free. So everybody should watch The Great Hack on Netflix. Whichever side of the aisle you fall on, it's really worth watching, if for nothing else than to realize how data is being used and manipulated uh, across whole swaths of our population. And to understand, it's not just bioethics, but it's, it's data ethics that we have yet to grapple with. And we don't know how that's going to work out. I mean, once we get genetic testing down to a science, and how are, how how are you going to be able to get healthcare if your genes say that you're predisposed to certain diseases? Uh, it's going to be a, a strange world that we live in, and not a good one. So, uh, a combination of the great hack, and if I might recommend years and years on HBO, the new Russell Davies series. It's only six episodes. Watch those two things. They're very much worth watching. And um, yeah, so Mark, thank you for that, uh, supporting the channel as you do. You're one of the great supporters of the channel, and I want to thank you. Oops, and see, you sent something else in. Mark C says, want to know why there were so many Captain Marvel videos? It drove the algorithm to create views and money for channels. Um, yes. No, absolutely. But you know, that happens. I mean, when a hot button subject comes, like I don't. If I wanted to make more money on YouTube, and I probably should, I, there, I could be doing this as a full-time job and and driving views and 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 uh, and playing the analytics is something that a lot of these channels are doing because you know there's companies that that's what they do. They're making money off YouTube. I I just haven't been doing that enough, and I probably could be, but I don't. I only do this. I was telling Michael Davis, the director of Shoot 'Em Up. Um, by the way, watch the very fine documentary that Dave Parker and I worked on that I produced that's on the shoot 'em up Blu-ray. But, uh, uh, you know, Michael Davis was pointing out that he liked as long as I was, I, I was telling him, I'm like, you know, I know that a lot of people think it's probably pretty silly that I do these YouTube chats, but I've been on YouTube for four years. I like doing this. If it wasn't fun for me, I wouldn't do it anymore. If I was working on this eight or 10 hours a day, I might not be having as much fun. I think I'm pushing it as, uh, as, as it goes. I want to make these more. I have all this equipment here to make these more sophisticated, like John's chats, John Campy's chats. I could do that. I want to move into my Imaginarium, uh, which is basically out in the garage where all my books are and all my stuff. I have a really cool set. I haven't done that yet either. I even haven't put lights in these. And the lights are there, but the, I've fixed the fuses. But I don't ever want it to not be fun anymore. But the way that everybody's changing these analytics and things, it's, it's, it's really, it's really um, unfortunate. Now, I can understand they don't want to target children. And there's a lot of weird stuff going on on YouTube and a lot of strange sites. I get that. But in the fan community, and I, I, I don't like it when ideas, legitimate ideas about culture uh, get squashed. That's what, I, that's what scares me the most. And um, as we're going into another election season, it's going to get really weird all right ladies and gentlemen boys and girls non-binary people crazy aliens from the uh, the epsilon eridani system it's great to hear from a real alien today because you know i knew they were out there but anyway i want to say thank you for everybody who watched this chat please hit like and subscribe if you haven't uh it's great to have that it helps the analytics comment all you want please interact uh, it's great to have you all here. I want to thank my moderators, the, the Honorable Mike Bodden, who's been at a mayor's conference in Washington, D.C., because believe it or not, he's the mayor of Riverdale, Iowa. We've got Terry all the way from the U.K. We've got Greg Smith up in Washington State. And, of course, Detective Jim. Detective Jim, I want to know, buddy, how close are you 
to getting a new passport. I was on the passport website the other day. I can get my passport renewed. I just have to pay for it and I have to take new passport photos. Detective Jim, what are you doing to get your passport? Because we're having a race. Mine expires in September. So we're getting there, buddy. You got to get a passport so you can come see Bond 25 with the rest of us in old Blighty Town. We'll hang out with Terry. We'll drink beers. Uh, unless you're, uh, if uh, I apologize. I don't know whether you imbibe or not. But if you don't, if you're a teetotaler or you're just not drinking, that's okay too. They've got great tea in London. I have it on great authority. Anyway, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank the moderators. And thanks for everyone, all of you imagination connoisseurs who make this the Post Geek Singularity community so much fun to be a part of. Thanks for hanging out for this long chat. Thanks for supporting the channel. Remember, this was brought to you by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products for those men who want to look good and feel great. By the way, you know what? It always helps the channel out if everybody goes and buys some Lucky Tiger at the end of the month. Keeps my numbers up and keeps my keeps my sponsorship worthy. I did drop another episode of Living the Lucky Tiger Life, uh, which is interesting. I once again talked to James Hills. I talked to him first on a Norwegian cruise ship up in Vancouver, and then I talked to him in Florida at this boutique hotel called the Wannabe Inn, this kitschy hotel right on the ocean. And he talked about Punta Gorda, Florida, a place I'd never heard of, but it's on the Gulf side of Florida. And uh, if you want to go watch that, you it's another interview with James. And it sounds I want to go after listening to him talk about Punta Gorda, Gorda, Florida. He made me want to go there. He also made me want to go eat crab. And you'll see why. But uh, that's just it's just a fun show. I like doing the living the lucky tiger life. But if you all go there and punch in PGS for Post Geek Singularity, buy some of their product, support the channel that way. That's always a good way to do it. And plus, you'll look good and feel great. So what's wrong with that? So I'm going to end this chat number one. Chat number, was it 184 <laughs> or 183? Either way, we'll know. Uh, thanks for being here. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I bring this chat to an end. And I bid you all farewell. And as always, have a better day. <laughs>